The Empress Returns, by Iowa Forever. Chapter 2.08, The Jaws of Cetus, Miracles and Memories. Within 30 minutes of the mutiny, the Tyranids had stormed New Rin City. Thousands of lesser organisms led the charge, overwhelming what few guardsmen held out in the southern half of the city. Jenna stealers and cultists threw open bomb shelters and hideaways beneath municipal buildings, inviting their masters to a slaughter of men, women, and children who could do nothing to defend themselves against the high fleet. Carnifexes and trigons tore through the streets, smashing vehicles and statues to ruin in their hunt for foes to slay while hive tyrants and zoanthropes conducted the swarm from above. All the sisters could hear was screaming. Despite the impulse, they continued away from the carnage. Clear, Ruth called, she and Judith leading the way out of the alley. Rebecca shifted about, doing her best to keep Bianca steady as she and Veronica followed after the first two. The wounded hospitaller gave a moan, whether from pain or the cocktail of drugs Rebecca had to administer to keep her lucid, but the sisters could not stop to tend to her. Not yet. How much further until we reach the river? Veronica asked. The river Rin is still several blocks away, Naomi said from the rear. Hopefully the Tyranids have not cut off our escape, or we'll have to swim for it. Given our circumstances, I think that will only make things worse. Rebecca replied. You should leave me, Bianca slurred. I'm dying anyway, leave me and save yourselves from the swarm. We're not leaving you, Bianca, Veronica snapped. Don't think like that. We'll get you to friendly lines, and then find a doctor to help you. I am a doctor, and I should know when one is beyond saving. Bianca coughed, a small drop of blood falling on Rebecca's shoulder. Please, for your sakes, leave me. No. Rebecca fixed Bianca with a stare. We're going to get you help. Just just hold on for a little longer. Bianca returned Rebecca's stare with doubt, but said nothing more before gunfire erupted from behind them. Contact rear, Naomi bellowed, ducking behind a wrecked car as she fired down the lane. Beyond, Rebecca could see a smaller swarm of gaunts led by several warriors. The larger organisms screeched as they spotted the sisters, the gaunt strain swarming about as they fired their own bioweapons at their targets. Rebecca, Veronica, continue on. Judith and Ruth, with me, we might be able to slow them down for a moment. But sister Naomi Rebecca started. No arguing. Go, now. Naomi let out another burst of fire, joined soon by Ruth as the two sisters fell back to assist the superior. Rebecca hesitated, chewing her lip for a moment as she watched her fellows dig in to stall the swarm, but a shift from Veronica told her it was time to keep moving. Please Empress she whispered. Don't let it end like this not for any of us. No sooner had Rebecca finished her prayer that she heard a roar from overhead. Two green painted aircraft swept down from the buildings, weapons blazing as they targeted the Tyranids beyond. The warriors shrieked before assault cannons shredded through them and their minions, the Tyranids falling into disarray under the assault. The two aircraft slowed, engines shifting as they dropped into hovering mode, and Rebecca could not help but smile as she saw their insignias. The White Dragon of the Salamanders. The Astartes had come to their rescue. Rebecca and Veronica slowed, just as a squad of space marines came hurrying up the lane. The silhouette of Mirshan was easy to identify, the Forgefather's scale cloak flapping in the downdraft produced by the attack aircraft. See, Bianca? We'll get you help, you'll see. I don't want to be too harsh. Rebecca, Bianca said weakly. But you are wasting your strength on me. Rebecca's smile slipped, but only slightly. Mirshan's squad moved past them to relieve Naomi, Ruth, and Judith, the Forge Father himself stopping before Rebecca and Veronica. Your medic is injured? He asked, his voice soft. She was struck by a mutant during the defense of the wall. Rebecca explained. She she's in a bad way, but we can help her. No doubt. Mirshan said. Where are the others? Miss Tara and Lord Matthias? Rebecca's smile finished falling, her blood running cold. She stood in silence for several moments before Naomi spoke up from behind her. Tara and the Inquisitor took a day to inspect the spaceport, she said. We have not been in contact with them since. Then we are at a crisis. Mirshan said, moving past the sisters and looking down the road. The Tyranids have overrun the spaceport and the southern half of the city, and more are advancing in by the hour. My brothers and I have set up defensive lines along the northern banks of the river, but our forces are spread thin even with the guard fleeing north. He looked back to Rebecca. There is a medical facility where we may treat your friend. A storm robin is just around the corner, go before she falls further. Thank you, Lord Astartes. Rebecca nodded. Come on, Bianca just hold out for a little longer. Bianca did not respond, her head hanging limp. Bianca? 
Bianca, can you hear me? Mirshan stepped up, gently placing a hand against Bianca's neck. Your friend is fading fast. Mirshan said. I would advise you make her comfortable for her last moments Rebecca's breath became choppy, even as Veronica eased Bianca down to the ground. Bianca? Rebecca said, taking the hospitaler's hand in her own. Bianca, please focus on me. WW we're almost to safety, we'll get you help. It's too late for that Bianca whispered, giving a weak cough. Rebecca, promise me promise me you will protect Angelique. No no, you'll be fine, Rebecca cried. It's just a little further, then we can get you to a healer. But Bianca gave no reply, her hand falling limp in Rebecca's grasp. Tears filled Rebecca's eyes, her jaw aching as she tried to hold back sobs. Rebecca, Naomi said, placing a hand against Rebecca's backpack. We need to keep moving. We will have vengeance for Bianca, but that will do us no good if we are overrun. No Rebecca said, tears dripping down her face. I'm not leaving her here. Not like this. She reached out, pressing against Bianca's chest in an effort to keep her heart beating. Nothing, but that did little to slow Rebecca. Not like this. Not like this. Just as Rebecca started another round of compressions, a brilliant flash filled her vision. Warm energy spilled over the sister, her entire body tingling as it flowed through her. She let out a small gasp, joined by a much deeper one from Sister Bianca as the hospitaler spasmed, coughing several times before the light faded away. The last thing Rebecca saw was an image like that of a small insect, fading until it was just her and the others again. I am alive? Bianca asked, her legs twitching as she moved back. I can feel my legs again what did you do? I, I don't know. Rebecca started, giving a small yelp before her hand flew to her throat. WH what happened to my voice? Rebecca Ruth breathed. You you brought her back from the dead look. Your arm. Rebecca looked down at her arms. Her left arm, from the elbow down, was now clad in a golden narthosium, the helix engraving replaced by a small pink gem cut in the shape of the insect from her vision. She turned her arm over, blinking as if the narthosium would vanish as soon as it arrived, but it remained fixed to her armor. I she stammered. I wanted to heal Bianca, but this. This is a miracle, Ruth cried quickly making the sign of the Aquila before continuing. To think, my sister-in-arms has been blessed by the Empress in such a way. Truly, her hand is mighty that lifts my sister into the esteemed ranks of Celestine and Sabbat, a saint of the Imperium. Rebecca's face flushed. I, I wouldn't go that far she stammered, but all conversation was cut off by a shriek from the south. It seems the Tyranids have taken notice. Mirshan said, reaching out to help Bianca back to her feet. We must hurry. The Storm Raven is waiting for you. The sisters nodded, Ruth and Veronica leading the way while Bianca stepped towards Rebecca. Saint or not, the hospitaler started. Thank you, Rebecca. I have often thought of my death, but I am glad that it was held off for just a little longer. You you're welcome, Sister Bianca, Rebecca said, retrieving her bolter before continuing. I cannot say I really understand what I did, but if it were not for your help I doubt I could have done any of this the two said nothing more as a screech echoed down the road. Rebecca turned, spotting a few Tyranids tentatively picking through the rubble, the Salamander's storm talons shifting their engines to bring their guns to bear. Let's make sure you live to use such power again. Harlequins. Matthias had not encountered many Eldar during his time in the Inquisition. Explored some of their ruins, yes. Fiddle with some of their technology, yes. But never before had he stood face to face with one, much less one of the Harlequins. And yet here was one, and it had just greeted Terra as if she were an old friend. Not that she returned the sentiment. Where are we? Tara snapped, bringing her sword to bear. What do you want with me? There is nothing that I specifically want. The Harlequin said, almost playfully pushing Tara's sword away with its hand. But as to where we are, we have entered a small path on the webway. I will lead you back to your forces and away from the Great Devourer. Why? Matthias asked, keeping his bolt pistol at his side. Your kind has always had its motives when dealing with humanity, most of them to our detriment. Why go through this trouble instead of leaving us to die with the Tyranids? That is not the question you need to be asking, Inquisitor, the Harlequin looked to him, Matthias doing his best not to cringe as the twisted mask met his eye. The question you must ask is what you prize most, the survival of the Imperium, or your own zealotry? I am willing to deal with you for as long as possible, alien, Matthias said, eyes narrowing. But if during our dealings you prove yourself untrustworthy, I will not hesitate to kill you where you stand. When did I say that it was against me that you would be weighing your devotion? Matthias hesitated, the Eldar turning its gaze back to Terra. 
but we have tarried long enough haven't we, Twilight Maiden? Come, I will lead you back to your fellows. And with that the Harlequin started off down the path, its steps making no noise as it glided across the wraithbone floor. Orders, my lord? Nikolai said from behind Matthias. He said nothing, clenching his jaw before stepping up to Terra. It seems to have an interest in you, Matthias said. What do you want to do? What else can we do? Terra said, lowering her sword. I'd teleport us, but this place feels like a magic superconductor, there's no telling if my spells would just fizzle out, send us thousands of light years off target, or explode violently. We'll just need to follow and hope for the best. A terrible idea, if Matthias had to be honest, but they had few options now. Lead on, then, he said, storing his power sword while Terra started after the Harlequin or at least, where the Harlequin appeared to be, for all Matthias knew the Xenos was standing just off to his left, and the one leading them was an illusion to lure them into a trap. Stay calm, then you can assess the situation, he thought. The path before them was dark, winding. It curved gently along, rising and falling with every step they took, and Matthias could not find a straight line of reference anywhere he looked. Terra seemed to be frustrated as well, though whether from the geography of the webway or the enigma that was their guide he could not say. Time and again she made to speak, but the words appeared to die in her mouth as soon as they had come. Still, there were questions Matthias would like to have answered. Terra, he said, looking down at her. Why did you seem so familiar with this alien? Terra paused, her jaw tightening for a moment before she spoke. It she said. It started appearing in my dreams, after Caesarea. Never consistently, and never for too long, but it was there. Terra shuddered. Those were always the worst ones. Why didn't you tell me about this? He asked. If these aliens were assaulting you in your dreams, maybe I could have helped. I didn't know what to do, Matthias, Terra shook her head. I was dealing with a lot then, and you were busy with the fighting. I didn't want to be a bother to you all Matthias fell silent. Terra had improved since Caesarea, but to what extent? Did she still think with the mind of the vulnerable young woman Matthias had seen sobbing in the belly of a ruined tank? Was there a part of her innocence that still remained? It is no crime to ask questions, even if you do not wish to hear the answer. The Harlequin said, Matthias now noting the alien had shifted a meter to the right. You yourself have had plenty of questions about the Twilight Maiden, yet you fear what answer you might receive. Why do you keep calling her Twilight Maiden? Alexis asked. Some weird Xenos superstition? Superstition is irrational fear based on questions about the unknown. The Harlequin said, its voice now directly behind them even though Matthias knew it had not moved. But then, you step into the unknown every day, do you not? A pity that it will lead to your destruction. What's that supposed to mean? Alexis, you know the Eldar isn't going to give you a straight answer, Matthias snapped. Stop trying to provoke it until after we've left the webway. Trouble, Inquisitor? The Harlequin asked. Nothing you need to concern yourself with, alien. Of course the Harlequin continued to move on. Why would I seek to challenge a martyr? Matthias hesitated. The temptation to shoot the Harlequin returned, Matthias' finger tightening around the trigger of his bolt pistol, but soon the feeling passed. He walked on, though he found himself drawing closer to Terra the further they walked. Minutes passed in silence. Then, as Matthias and the other rounded yet another corner, he heard a whisper. It was faint, nothing more than a fleeting sound, but soon it returned, gaining more volume the closer they drew. No way we could have found the Herald so soon. The voice echoed. It took a moment for Matthias to realize it was Alexis' voice, echoing a conversation they had years ago. The chances are low, sure enough, Matthias' own voice said. Now, he could see a shadow drifting by, him and the two Valhallans standing before a calm station aboard the Sanguinium Martyrs. But this is the best lead we've gotten so far. We make for Tau space in the morning. Matthias, Terra whispered. Did you see that? In your tongue, this place is known as the Path of Memories. The Harlequin said, now standing on a ridge just above Matthias. The Wraith Singers that crafted this path poured so much of their psychic energy into manipulating the Wraith Bone that it gained the ability to feel the minds of those that passed through. Your memories will drift, but perhaps some may linger the alien look to Terra. Even if you do not want them to. Terra swallowed, shying away from the gaze of the alien. It's just trying to taunt you, Terra, Matthias wanted to say. Ignore it and let's keep moving. But the words died in his mouth reassurance being nothing more than hollow conjecture for Terra and the Valhallans. I hate this place. They walked on, more memories drifting in and out of their vision. Sorry Alexis, but I have a girlfriend you are a failure of a soldier, 
and I should shoot you now she's made time before. Sh she's made time Matthias shook his head, looking to where the harlequin was walking. I suppose asking you why you took us down this path is only going to get a cryptic answer? What is that saying you humans like to pass around? The harlequin asked. Ah, yes, ask not the Eldar a question, for they will give you three answers, all of which are true and all of which are equally terrifying. If you already know the answer, why bother to ask? And the answer to the one question you wish to know is standing right before you. Matthias paused, one eyebrow raised. As he tried to make sense of what the alien told him, a new memory flickered across his vision. It was a small horse. A foal, with a purple coat and a small nub of horn jutting from its skull, a battered book clutched in some psychic field that followed behind it. Some Eldar pet, perhaps? That thought was dashed as he examined it closer, noting the six-pointed starburst displayed prominently on its flanks. A starburst Terra now wore on her shoulder. Princess Celestia. The foal cried, its voice a tinier version of Terra's own. Matthias watched as the memory darted into a room, where a larger equinoid with both wings and a horn rested. Oh, good morning Twilight, the larger figure said, Matthias feeling his heart skip a beat or five. Empress? Your lessons are not for another hour. Is something wrong? Um, Spike was teething and he started chewing on this book the foal held the book to the larger horse. Can you fix it? No. Of course, Twilight. The older mare took the book. This will only take a minute. Come, sit with me and I'll explain how the spell works. Matthias took a step back, shaking his head as the image shifted. A Xena's trick, nothing more. The damn harlequin was trying to convince him of an impossibility, of treason. Rainbow dash. Stop. The foal, now a grown mare, held a light blue pegasus in her magical grip. Listen, Rainbow. I know you're upset with Applejack, but don't worry. Whatever it is that has come between you two, I'm sure that I, as a good friend, can help you resolve your problems. Uh, what are you talking about? The Pegasus asked. Oh, Rainbow Dash, you don't have to hide your feelings from me. I can tell you two must have had a terrible fight. The Purple Mare shoved the Pegasus onto a couch, pulling out a pen and paper as she continued. Now, why don't you tell me all about your issues with Applejack? This this can't be happening, Matthias cried, drawing his pistol and aiming it at the vision. What are you doing, Xenos? You wanted an answer, the Harlequin said from behind Matthias. I warned you that you might not like it. Yesterday, I heard voices calling through the warp, warning me of some coming disaster, the image changed again. The older mare from before was now dressed in great armor, the Empress armor, and stood in an ornate room of stained glass. Apparently, I was the only one to hear it, and what is more troubling is that it did not originate from Equestria, but from my old universe. Who sent it? The mare asked. Anyone that would be powerful enough to do something like this is dead or would wish to see me dead. If your greatest enemy warns you of coming danger, what does that say of the coming disaster? Matthias' hand tightened, the bolt pistol trembling in his hand. Lies, projections. The harlequin had to be trying to trick him. There was no way Terra was a Xenos. A Xenos who bore the same mark she wore on her armor, who spoke in the same voice who knew nothing of war, of humanity's struggle, who sought to mend relationships rather than fight. A Xenos who followed a being that spoke with the very words of the Empress of Mankind. So what does this have to do with me? Whatever awaits me, I must face it head on before it can harm or destroy Equestria. That is why I am going back to the Imperium of Mankind. And you are coming with me. No. Matthias raised his pistol and fired, unloading the weapon at the apparition. The image faded, the Hellfire shells smashing apart Wraithbone without further damage. He would have reloaded had not someone grabbed his arm. Matthias. Matthias whipped around to see Terra looking at him, concern lacing her features. What's wrong? What did you see? Matthias choked. Had she not seen the visions? If they really were her memories, would she have worried that he might have seen them? He tried to say something, anything to allay her concern, but the Harlequin spoke first. Humans always striving forward without concern of what lies ahead, it said. It is both your greatest strength and your greatest weakness. Though I would ask if you would kindly not destroy more of the webway than you already have. We do want to make this journey quick for all of you. A hiss of air caught Matthias' attention, the Inquisitor shifting his eyes to see a second Harlequin standing next to him, twin swords aimed directly at his throat. How he thought, before slowly lowering his pistol. It's nothing, he said finally. I got startled there for a moment. Let's keep moving. This seemed to placate Terra, the girl letting go of Matthias' arm and resuming her trek through the webway. 
the Valhallans regarded Matthias for a moment, as if he were about to give them new orders, before they too started after the retreating form of the Empress student. Matthias knew he had to keep walking, lest he be lost on the webway forever, but he still found himself standing and looking at where the memory had faded. Now you know more of who the Twilight Maiden is, the Harlequin whispered in Matthias' ear. She means more to you than just an enemy, or even a friend, even if you do not realize it just yet. Terra is not a Xenos, Matthias growled. And if all you are going to show me is lies, then you can just keep your visions to yourself. You say that, but down in your heart you know that the memories you glimpsed are true. The Harlequin drifted away. So ask yourself what truly matters more in your life, the fate of the Imperium, or your zealotry? Matthias said nothing. There was no point in arguing with the alien, especially if it was going to keep giving answers like that. Shooting it would just start a fight, and then where would that leave him or the Imperium? That was a question Matthias no longer knew the answer to. So he picked up his pace, hurrying to catch up with the others before they fell completely out of sight. The Valhallans kept their gaze forward, while Terra stood before what appeared to be an ornate wraithbone pillar. This will take us back to Rin's world? The webway has many hidden gates, even those invisible to many of our kind. The Harlequin said. Hurry now, for the hour is late. The Great Devourer draws closer, and you have still not answered our question. But every time I try you just Terra's words died in her mouth, for the Harlequin had vanished once more. It was just her, Matthias, and the Valhallans, all alone in the webway with only memories and broken wraithbone. Well, that was pleasant, Alexis muttered. Pity the Eldar weren't interested in any good memories. We've seen enough already. Nikolai countered. Terra stepped up to the pillar, gently placing her hand against the wraithbone. It shimmered, small trails of light running up her armor before she pulled her hand back. My magic feels more normal here she said. Maybe the Eldar was right and this is safe she was about to step through when Matthias spoke. Terra, wait. She turned, giving another concerned look. What is it, Matthias? She asked. There was a long pause, Matthias trying to think of a better way to open the discussion besides are you really a Xenos? The Valhallans looked between the two of them, all waiting for what Matthias had to say. What truly matters more in your life, the fate of the Imperium, or your zealotry? Back there, he started, licking his lips. When I fired, I saw I saw some of your memories. Oh? Tara asked, concern deepening. Nothing too bad, though? I know some of my memories have been a bit rough, especially after all I've been through. I Matthias stopped again. I just want to know one thing. Matthias met Terra's gaze with his own. There was no malice, no joy of deceiving a servant of the Imperium, just concern, innocence, the same look he had seen countless times since he found her and the Empress. A gaze so familiar, yet so alien at the same time. The Eldar often try to deceive us to follow their parameters, he said. I want to know, who do you serve? Another pause, Terra's head inclining as she thought. Matthias found his hand drifting towards another magazine of Hellfire shells, his finger brushing against the metal. Finally Terra spoke. I've seen so much pain, distrust, she said. I've seen people completely detached from all that they see, who care not when their friends and loved ones are torn asunder by weapons of great power. Then she smiled. But I have seen many good things as well. Courage, honor, men and women who rise to the challenge to save those who cannot help themselves. I've seen those who have punished themselves for their past sins find redemption, evil turned back by righteousness, and wounded souls take the first steps towards healing. Terra stepped forward, gently taking Matthias' hand in her own. I serve the Empress first and foremost, you know, she said. The Imperium has its faults, but it is still worth fighting for. And I'm glad I have such good friends like you and the sisters to guide me in that fight, to stand by my side as we save mankind. Matthias blinked, his eyes darting between Terra and his hand. With another smile, Terra leaned in and gave Matthias a full hug, the Inquisitor's arms hanging limp as he tried to make sense of this. Thank you again, for everything, she said. All Matthias could do was blink, holding still even as Terra broke away from him. Now, we should go and see where that portal takes us. After you, Matthias said, waiting patiently until Twilight had stepped through the portal. Chapter 2.09, The Jaws of Cetus, Confrontations Twilight stepped through the portal, pausing for a moment as her eyes adjusted. She was standing on the bank of a river, water rushing alongside her on the left. It was dark, the last few motes of light from the setting sun shining over the water. Ahead, Twilight could see the battered remains of a bridge, leading towards an island over which towered a massive building, the central spire of New Rin City. 
Twilight did not get a chance to gauge where exactly she was before something short and black barreled into her, armor scraping against armor as she was lifted off her feet. Hera. You're alive. Sister Judith squealed, squeezing Twilight tightly in her hug. Hi Judith Twilight gasped, wiggling to try and free herself from the sister's grasp. Judith did seem to get the message, gently placing Twilight back on the ground as Matthias and the Valhallen stepped out of the portal. The Inquisitor's alive too? That just makes this even better. There was a pause before Judith spoke again. Wait how did you even get here? Is this some mysterious psyker power I'm not supposed to know about? We had help, Matthias said, brushing past Judith. Where are the others? Manning the defenses on the river bank. Come, I'll take you to them. Judith ushered Twilight forward, the small group of humans moving slowly along the bank. Ahead, Twilight could see dozens of makeshift barriers and prefab fortifications, weary guardsmen hunkering down as they eyed the other side of the river. Twilight's heart caught as she saw how many were injured, dozens if not hundreds of men and women nursing bloody bandages or rickety splints. This is worse than I thought, she whispered. What happened? The Tyranids broke through the southern wall with the help of their cultists, Judith said, her voice soft. Fortunately an Astartes counter-attack held them off long enough for the survivors to finish this line here. There's been a steady trickle ever since, but that's something Lord Mirshan and his psychers have been helping to make sure no infiltrators followed us in. The Genestealers were already here. Twilight's heart dropped again. All of their defenses, all their hard work and planning, gone in an instant because of those creatures. And if only she had a little more time. Hera? Twilight was drawn back to reality by Judith's question. Is everything alright? I know how you feel about civilians and the losses we've taken, but we wouldn't want to lose you to your despair again. All Twilight hesitated. Logic told her to just say she was fine and move on, but with so many lost I'll need some time to myself, but I think I'll be alright. That's all we can ask for, I suppose. It was hard to tell expressions when Judith's face was hidden beneath her helmet, but Twilight was thankful for the sympathy. There was a pause before Judith perked up again. Oh, did you know Rebecca's a saint now? A what? Twilight asked, blinking in surprise. A saint. Judith chirped, all but bouncing on her feet. She brought Sister Bianca back from the dead and gained some kind of relic. Come on, I'll show you. I need to report to the acting commander here first, Matthias said, breaking away from Twilight with his Valhallans in tow. Though, would you happen to know where Sister Bianca is? She's tending to some of the wounded further to the north, Judith said, pointing towards the back of the fortifications before continuing. I can take you there too if you would like. I think I can manage on my own. As with that Matthias started off, the Valhallans following close behind. There was a lengthy pause before Judith spoke. What's with the Inquisitor? She asked. He seems less personable than usual. I think it's just stress from the combat, Twilight said, looking back as the sister. Matthias was well, he was startled by a lot of things on our way here. I think he'll be fine, though. If you say so, Tara, Judith said, bouncing on her heels again. Now come, you need to see Saint Rebecca. Okay Twilight did not struggle as Judith took her by the hand and led her further into the fortifications. Around her she saw injured, weary soldiers, guardsmen leaning against their last guns and heavy weapons as they stared blankly at her in the far bank of the river Rin. Some gave her slight nods or a half-hearted salute, but none of the spark she had seen following their arrival on Rin's world remained. No wonder, for Twilight had failed them. Sisters. Tara has returned. Judith called guiding Twilight forward towards the sisters. Ruth was the first to step forward, pulling Twilight into a tight hug once she drew close. Thank the Empress you're safe, Tara, she said. I have been praying since we arrived here for your deliverance, and she has seen fit to bring you to us in one piece. Thank you, Ruth, Twilight said, breaking away and giving a quick smile. Are you alright? Only minor wounds, Naomi said, coming up behind Twilight. Twilight blinked in surprise to see the sister superior's helmet was missing, but Naomi made no mention of it as she continued. We were fortunate enough that the Tyranids focused on the guard and the Astartes rather than us for what it was worth. I know there was a pause before Twilight spoke again. And then there's the thing with Rebecca. Right. Naomi nodded, turning aside so Twilight could see Rebecca and Veronica. The latter was at the barricade, watching over the river with a few guardsmen, while the former sat with her back to the group. She has been quite quiet since we arrived, ever since she Naomi furrowed her brow. I am not quite sure what it is, but it is unlike any miracle I have borne witness to. All the more reason she is to be considered a saint, Ruth cried, drawing a look from Twilight and Naomi. 
apologies, sister Naomi, but you are right and this is a blessing unlike any other. I'm just so happy for my sister. We know, Naomi said. And your passion is quite welcome, just don't overwhelm Tara or Rebecca, please. Ruth nodded in response. Sensing an opportunity, Twilight stepped towards Rebecca, placing a hand on the sister's shoulder. Rebecca? Twilight asked. Rebecca turned, her face brightening when she saw Twilight. It was now that Twilight could see the sister's left arm was encased in golden armor, a short apparatus resembling Bianca's Narthesium jutting out along her arm. More importantly, she saw the pink butterfly gem set in the center. Tara, Rebecca said, standing up and giving Twilight yet another hug. When did you get here? Are you injured? Oh, I had thought you lost when I heard the spaceport had fallen, but to see you standing here. I know, Twilight broke from Rebecca's embrace. But I'm here now, and I'm all right. Good, good, Rebecca said before her face fell. Oh, um there was the thing about me being a saint and all. Right. Twilight took Rebecca's arm, examining the Narthesium closely. It shimmered with every motion the sister took, the pink gem gleaming in the low light. It it can't be how how did you get this? Sister Bianca was hit by a mutant during the attack, Rebecca said softly. I I tried to do what I could to help her, but she died Tara. Rebecca took Twilight by the arm. She died and there was nothing I could do to stop it. I wanted so badly to help her, to make up for all the time she helped me, and then she looked down at the Narthesium. All of a sudden there was a flash and Bianca was healed, and I had this on my arm. And now everyone is calling me a saint because of what I did. Well Twilight started, but Rebecca could not be stopped. I appreciate that I healed Bianca, but I am no saint. I'm just a humble sister in service to the Empress, I have no mind for greatness. Twilight did not get to say more before Rebecca all but shoved the Narthesium into her face. Please, tell me it isn't so. A uh, Twilight examined the Narthesium. There was no denying it, Rebecca currently had the element of kindness strapped to her arm. Probably not the same one that she currently had hidden in a book back in her library, but it was the element of kindness nonetheless. So many implications, so many chances to study if only there wasn't a rampaging horde of alien monsters trying to eat everyone. This isn't something I can just take away, Twilight said finally, pushing Rebecca's arm back. Not even the Empress has control over this. She doesn't? Ruth said from behind Twilight. But why? There are some things out there that are more powerful than even her, as weird as it sounds sometimes. Twilight turned to look at the other sisters. But this is a good thing, Rebecca has been blessed with a great gift, a gift that could help to bring peace back to the Imperium once and for all. This drew a whimper from Rebecca, and confused looks from the others. How can something be more powerful than the Empress and still be considered good? Ruth asked. Lack of spikes? Judith offered, a metallic clang ringing out as Ruth smacked the back of Judith's head. I can't really explain that, Twilight said before she paused. Well, I can try. On my home world there's a legend of six powerful artifacts called the Elements of Harmony. Odd name, Naomi said. What can be so harmonious about them? They were said to represent five great virtues in mankind, Twilight continued, trying to get the right words to say to the sisters without saying too much. Kindness, generosity, laughter, loyalty, and honesty. When brought together they manifested the sixth artifact, a crown of purest magic, and from there she paused. From there, the wielders could strike down gods. Gods? Ruth breathed. Only the Empress has that kind of power, and yet you say these artifacts are greater still? Well, she used them once to defeat a spirit of chaos, Twilight said. But trying to use them again, the elements rejected her. Why? Is not the Empress exemplar of all virtues? Ruth folded her arms across her chest. What good can they be if they reject her holiness? I have to agree with Ruth, Naomi said. These elements sound like something that cannot be trusted. But we cannot just leave this knowledge sit, if these weapons fall into the wrong hands, I'd hate to think some monster would use them to try and kill the Empress. Oh, there's nothing to worry about, Twilight said quickly. The elements aren't weapons, and can't be wielded by just anyone, if anyone who isn't a true exemplar of that virtue tries to use one, they're useless. And they can't use their full power without the full set. Twilight looked to Rebecca. Rebecca, do you want to kill the Empress? No. Never. Rebecca shook her head. Why would you even say such a thing? It was just an example, Twilight looked back at the others. See? Nothing to worry about. I will be convinced when I see this for myself, Ruth said, finally uncrossing her arms. If these elements are truly as powerful as you say, and as benevolent as you say, 
they would have all manifested now so that we may slay the hive mind and free Rin's world. I don't have control over how the elements manifest, Twilight said. If I did, we'd all have them right now. But we have to work with what we've got. She turned back to the river. She thought she could see Tyranids scrambling around the edges, but at this range it was hard to tell if it was them or just the low light playing with her mind. Girls, I know things seem bad right now, and I know what I'm saying doesn't make sense, but you have to trust me. The elements are good, and they will help us win Rin's world. She turned to the sisters. You just have to trust me please. There was a lengthy pause, the sisters looking to one another. Twilight spirits fell with every second they remained silent, she could understand a little hesitancy, but the sisters would not give up so easily would they? Finally, Rebecca stepped forward. I did not ask for this honor, she said, massaging her arm in the Narthesium. I did not ask to be chosen to bear any element of harmony, and if it is a truly terrible power I wield, I'd rather have none of it. There was a pause before she spoke again. But I am a sister of the Order of Our Martyred Lady. I am no stranger to performing duties I had no intention or desire to do, and I never back down from them. I will stand by your side, Tara, no matter what becomes of this. As will I, Ruth said. And I. Added Judith. And I as well, Naomi said, stepping up to Twilight. We all will. For we are soldiers of the Imperium, and we have never backed down before. No matter what powers and evils come against you, we will fight on, no matter what. Twilight smiled a small tear forming at the edge of her eyes. Thank you, girls, she whispered. It it really means a lot to me. You're very welcome, Naomi said. Now, we have a war to win. Celestia sat in silence, her chin resting on the blade of her clawed gauntlet. Johnson's message had been simple, and yet with one message the entire campaign had been thrown into jeopardy. Empress, Johnson had said. The Rinsguard has betrayed us. I do not know how but they have fired on our position and allowed the Xenos to advance. We are pulling back to defensive positions and will hold until your arrival. I know not the status of Korax or your student, but I have reason to believe they too are under attack. We will hold. Even if none of us are left standing when you arrive, we will hold. The message had fallen dead after that. And all Celestia could do was brood. Jenna Steelers. How could she have overlooked Jenna Steelers? With how much turmoil the warp was in with the hive mind having arrived in force, she had made sure to examine every detail, every stratagem as closely as possible. But even the sheer possibility should have come up in any one of their discussions, the Imperium had been battling the Tyranids for centuries, surely they had learned most of the Xenos tricks by now. Or maybe the thought entered her mind. Maybe the arrogant old fool of the Great Crusade took control and sent two sons and my favored student off to certain death without taking into account all they might face there. She continued to brood, her chin starting to ache from where it pressed into her armor. Her officers looked to her for guidance, as if some word she would say would make everything right. But with none coming, they continued to watch and wait, doing the barest minimum to keep the battleship coordinated with the rest of the fleet. Once more, she had failed her sons. Perhaps there was enough time to attack and save them, but the hive mind would not allow her through so easily. Rin's world was slowly slipping from her grasp, and all she could do was brood. In fine form today, aren't we? How soon can we make the jump to warp space? She asked, lifting her head from her hand. We can be ready within five minutes, my empress. The astropath on duty said. We will just need to calculate the jump and take into account any further corrections. No need. I shall be navigating us through, Celestia said. Just make sure Geller fields are at full power and our engines are primed. I'll take care of the rest. But empress, the astropath cried. The shadow of the warp is strong, and will grow stronger the closer we get to Rin's word. Do not risk yourself. I am well aware of the risk. Celestia barked, eyes flashing for a brief moment. But too many men and women have died while I have sat here and done little more than hold the door to their doom. I am going to take us into the heart of the storm, and we will destroy every tyrannid that dares to move against my people. Make sure all the machinery is in place, and I will handle the navigation. Yes Empress. The astropath nodded meekly, turning back to his subordinates before relaying her orders. Perhaps a bit too harsh, but the situation was precarious enough as it was, a little more force was needed to make sure the officers completed their jobs without too much panicking. Now, to other matters. Celestia leaned back, allowing her psychic powers to reach out through the battleship. As any old piece of machinery around the Imperium, the ship had an incredibly strong machine spirit residing within it. It merely considered her an oddity, a powerful but ultimately insignificant passenger traipsing down its halls as many had before. 
Now that she had directly reached out to command the ship, the spirit took notice. Like most of its kind, the machine spirit could not speak as a human could. Pulses of memories, emotions, flickers of battles and defeats from eons past, all passed before Celestia's mind, all coming to a central question, who are you? Search your memories, spirit, she replied, sending out a wave of her own memories. I am she whom your masters call Omnissiah. It was I who laid your keel in the foundries of Mars, who spoke the word that gave you life to command, a thirst for battle. You will submit, and I shall lead you to crush the enemies of mankind who dare blaspheme against you and your charges. An angry burst of scrap code and memories of shattered ships greeted her mind. So the spirit was going to be difficult, then I am beyond any you have met before, or will meet in years to come, spirit. Search your memories, for you know you stand before one greater than you. You will submit, and when this task is done I shall release you. More scrap code, inquisitive this time. You know your enemy, and you have heard my name. I am the Empress, master of mankind and all machines under my banner. For this mission, I am master over this vessel, I do not wish to force you into this, but I will do what I can to save those I love as you would I suppose. The machine spirit has no concept of love, and voice the same. But to allow aliens and heretics to slaughter your crew, that would be a blemish upon your very being. I will not allow such a thing to happen, to your charges and mine. Of this, we are of the same mind. Will you submit? Empress, another astropath said. All systems are operational. Is the machine spirit willing to accept you? It is, Celestia said, her voice echoing through the bridge. Have all hands prepare for warp transit. I will plot the course. Yes, my Empress. Celestia focused, an image of the local region of space forming in her mind. The machine spirit would provide some assistance with navigation, lines and paths forming through the gaps in the shadow that led to Rin's world. Unfortunately, the spirit was not the only one to take notice of the plan. Empress does not understand what we are accomplishing. The dull roar of the hive mind echoed through her thoughts. We bring unity upon those within your world. All will become like us, to strengthen the swarm. You will die for this. Celestia replied, her soul raging at the thought the alien would think this beneficial. You will die screaming, and I will take great satisfaction at watching all that you are burned, for you have threatened my subjects, my student, my sons. All will be consumed. Such is our way, such is our being. Empress cannot stall this, cannot fight against the swarm. I will, and you will die. Finally, she found a suitable path to take the fleet through. I have located the warp space lane. Are we prepared for transit? Yes, my Empress. Good. Have all astropaths and navigators focus on my signature. There was a pause, Celestia reaching out through the warp as she waited for the others of the fleet to focus on her. One by one, the psychers of the fleet flickered into her mind, their power intermingling with her own and the crusade fleet linked up. That task complete, Celestia pushed forward, opening the portal into the jaws of Cetus. The cultists hurried along a small gaggle of civilians, their leader barking orders for the mutants to keep their prisoners in line. Some wept, others just followed in mute shock, perhaps in the vain hope that the cultists would release them if they remained quiet. With the city as damaged as it was, travel was slow even for the mutants, the small group scrambling over rubble and ruined vehicles in their march south. All had gone well, until the leading cultists seized up before falling apart into a pile of shredded meat. The others had no chance to react before a shadow lunged out of thin air, claws flashing as it tore through armor and flesh as if it were mist. The civilians shrieked and drew closer together, getting only a glimpse of black and silver as their deliverer tore through cultist and mutant with ease. In a minute it was over, and Korax's sons descended from the nearby building to join him. They have become disorganized. Korax mused, wiping the blood from his claws. Had they full command, these captives would have been halfway to the hive fleet by now. Lead the civilians back to friendly lines, I will continue our hunt from here. Yes, my lord. The leader of the veterans nodded before he and his fellows approached the Rinites, one Astartes removing his helmet as if to reassure the civilians they meant no harm. Korax did not stay to watch, jumping back up into the air until the shadows once more concealed him. The enemy had breached the walls faster than he had anticipated. Hit and run attacks such as this had left dozens of Tyranids and cultists great and small dead, but it was like using a sponge to slow down a flood. Still, the guard had retreated in good form, and the Tyranids had appeared to slow down once they reached the river Rin, so perhaps there was some chance at holding the city. Not if there were still traitors to be found, Korax reminded himself. He alighted onto another rooftop, scanning the city for signs of activity. Beyond, 
he could see the central spire of New Rin City and the imperial lines on the far bank, but there was little sign of any activity, hostile or otherwise. Frowning, Korax jumped forward, using minimal boosts from his jump pack to avoid detection as he dropped down on the street. All he found was carnage. Cultists and guardsmen lay strewn across the road, stacked up in heaps where they had been cut down. Korax approached one pile of bodies, pushing them over with his boot as he inspected their injuries. The topmost cultist had been eviscerated, dry and clotted organs squishing under Korax's feet, but the strike appeared as a clean cut from the neck down to the hips. Too clean for a cultist's knife, or even a tyranid blade. Too long for any guardsman's weapon. As Korax ran his hand through the cut, he could feel a faint tingling sensation run up his arm towards his neck. Warp energy. The traitors were here. Korax pulled the corpse towards him, flicking one blade to neatly split open the cultist's head. Quietly he licked any trace remains of blood and brain matter that remained on his claw, hoping to discern any memories the cultist might have had before it died. The only discernible images he was able to pick out was a flash of red, and the faintest image of a giant with a flaming skull. Lorger. Korax rose, looking around for any more signs. No traitors had fallen in the struggle, but minute details to their arrival could be seen, a bolt shell here, the broken tooth of a chainsword there. He moved on, searching body after body for any more signs, until he found one that he could not ignore, a bloody boot print, matching the size of an Astartes. He moved back to the rooftops, scanning the city for any signs of further activity. He could see more carnage, but from this range it was impossible to tell if it was from traitors or imperial shelling. Korax frowned, jumping towards another building, but once more all he found was rubble and broken vehicles. Where are you, traitor he muttered. Korax did not expect an answer. He got one. A chill raced over his arm, drawing his attention to the north. As if a hand guided his head, he found his gaze falling upon the central spire, the chill running back down his spine once more. Grimacing, Korax fired his jump pack again, crossing the narrower parts of the river as he came to the center spire of the city. No sign of traitors, save perhaps one or two cultists lying dead in the river, but Korax could not focus on that right now. The central spire was a massive building, a fading monolith to mankind's strength in the low light of evening. It was not as ornate as some spires and hive cities around the Imperium, but this particular side still possessed several carvings and sculptures of angels standing over the bodies of slain orcs. Korax paid them no mind, though, keeping his head down as he searched for the source of the chill that had drawn him here, claws at the ready in case the traitor sought to ambush him. Finally, he found a large opening near the north side of the spire. It was perfectly rectangular, revealing a series of steps leading down into the depths of the spire. Even in the low light Korax could see a number of familiar sigils and glyphs lining the walls, every one of them flickering slightly and causing his eyes to ache. Typical of chaos glyphs, but that was probably nothing compared to what awaited him inside. He advanced onward, his boots clicking against the stone the further and he walked. The stairs ended in a hallway, surprisingly cut to fit a man of Korax's stature. The walls were lit with dim golden lights, illuminating more profane sigils carved centuries before by cultists and madmen. Some Korax recognized from his journeys through the galaxy, but others were unlike any of the others the followers of Chaos liked to march under. He continued, using the light of his claws to illuminate his way, walking in silence for several moments before he came to the end of the hall. The hall opened into a massive room, such that Korax questioned how no one had noticed it when they built the city in the first place. In the center appeared to be an altar, on which was strapped a very large, struggling gene stealer, perhaps the patriarch of the cult that had overthrown New Rin City. A circle of red and silver clad Astarte stood silently around the room, while one dressed in black approached the altar and the captive tyrannid. And presiding over it all was a familiar red clad Primarch, flames flickering around his horned head. Korax said nothing as he leapt from the shadows, claws drawn back to strike. One of the traitors shifted, catching sight of him just as he closed the distance. Loyalist. The word bearer cried, though he failed to bring his weapons around before Korax gutted him with a single strike. Others in the circle turned, bringing bolters to bear as Korax fell upon a second traitor, a vicious uppercut sending half of the traitor's torso spinning off to the far corner of the room. Korax leapt back, allowing the shadows to close around him as he picked another target, hoping to clear the chaff away before going straight for Lorger. But he never got the chance. Lorger spoke a word and flicked his hand forward, a wall of force smashing into Korax and pinning him against the wall. He tried to move, but the grinding of stone caught his attention as the very walls closed in around his jump pack and claws, pinning him fully as the traitors circled. Some raised their bolters to fire before their master spoke. Hold fire. Lorger barked. 
let us not spill the blood of brothers here today. Proceed with the ceremonial preparations while I have words with my brother. There was a pause, the word bearers dutifully lowering their weapons as Lorger stepped up to Korax. Korax thrashed, hoping to loosen the grip the walls had on his hand, but to no avail. I was wondering whether or not you got my message, brother, Lorger said, a thin smile spreading across his face. I would never ignore the presence of traitors, Lorger, Korax spat. What are you doing here? Why brother, no courtesy and a greeting after so long. I am crushed. Lorger put his hand to his chest in mock anguish. But I suppose the years have made you more direct. You are much like the lion in that regard, no? Why don't you ask him? I'm sure he'd love to discuss pleasantries with you after he's ripped your head from your body. Hmm, I have felt that before, cannot say I cared for it, Korax said nothing as Lorger laughed at his joke. But to answer your original question, I am here to help. Let me go, and I'll show you my gratitude for your assistance. Korax growled. In time, brother. Lorger turned back towards the altar. You will thank me, for by this time tomorrow the Tyranids will die, mewling like the brainless insects they have always been. You'll follow them soon after, you know. Ha! Huh. I have too much work left unfinished to die today. Lorger turned around. But you know that I speak the truth. The power I serve is far greater than any you have seen, even more than that dullard you call Empress. Korak stayed silent. Oh? No defiance? No rising to the defense of your beloved murderer? We are all murderers, Lorger, Korak said. Do not think you can hold moral superiority over her in that regard. I have every right to. Lorger furrowed his brow as he continued. You should as well, or have the memories of Lycaeus faded completely from your mind? Who would you say deserves more blame, the taskmaster with his whip, or the aristocrat who delights in the taskmaster's antics? When you are a slave, you learn soon that the taskmasters are just as petty and cruel as the aristocrat they serve. Korax's eyes narrowed. I'm surprised 15,000 years of slavery to the dark gods hasn't enlightened you to that fact. I am no slave, Lorger snapped. I am perhaps the most free of all men, the one who has truly seen what lies beyond, what the true power of the warp is. You and all the others are just too blind to your old beliefs to realize that the world has changed, that what you have been fighting for is nothing more than a hollow dream built upon lie after lie. I fail to see how slaughtering innocents for no greater purpose than the fact that you can is more truthful than fighting for a rebuilt imperium. Is an imperium based on lies and deceit truly worth building, though? Lorger turned away. You know how much the emperor hid from us, what he forced us to do to build his empire while we were destined to be thrown out like scraps. I could not stand the hypocrisy of his vision, so I did what any man in his right mind would do, rebel against the corrupt, the weak, and the arrogant. By betraying your brothers and trusting yourself to dark gods? Lorger rounded on Korax, eyes blazing with fury. My brothers? He spat. Where were my brothers when the emperor forced me to kneel before him? Where were my brothers when the ultramarines celebrated in the ruins of Monarchia? Where were my brothers when innocent and loyal citizens were killed for no greater crime than seeing a different path? Korax said nothing again as Lorger turned away. If that does not tell you that you serve a false, petty king, then you are just as heartless as he is. Any more heartless than Horus throwing my sons into a slaughter they could not overcome? Korax countered. I tire of this conversation. If you are going to kill me, get it over with instead of sermonizing to me. Oh, I am not the one to kill you today. Lorger stepped back. I have seen the paths of fate, and yours does not end here the Tyranids are not so lucky but then you can thank me for that when we are finished. Lorger's expression softened. I do not wish us to be enemies, Korax. You and I have both been wronged, and perhaps done much wrong as well. Do you truly think a mere word from the Emperor is enough to blot out the shame of the mutants you created to stop Horus? Korax remained silent. I only offer you a hand of friendship, Korax. Wipe out the guilt completely, turn away from the lies and shame. The Emperor can only offer you so much while I will overlook all transgressions that have passed between us. We can make this Imperium truly great under the banner of chaos, if only you would see the truth. Please, Lorger extended a hand. Join me, Korax, before you are swept away by the tide. There was a lengthy pause, Korax glaring up at Lorger. He would have liked to muster up one last burst of strength and claw the traitor's face off, but whatever magics Lorger was using held him fast. So, he would resort to words. I would rather be swept away than accept fealty to you, traitor, he said. Lorger hesitated before giving a sigh and dropping his hand. Of all those that still live, I had thought you would be the one to see reason, he said. But I suppose that time has passed. Truly, Korax, 
I had hoped we might become friends again, but I find myself disappointed a pause before Lorger looked up. No matter. I have wasted enough time as it is. I hope you enjoy this display of true power, Korax. And with that Lorger turned away from Korax, descending until he was back on level ground with his sons, a black dagger materializing in his hand as he approached the restrained gene stealer patriarch. Chaos is true power, he said, in its light, who can stand against it? It draws strength from all actions, all beings, all forms, from the death of the first stars to the budding of new grass. All that hope to stand against it are overthrown, so that only the truth remains. He stopped just before the altar. The gene stealer hissed, trashing to try and get at the demon primarch, but to no avail. The tenth gate opens. First, the stench of the alien that our might may be felt. With one fluid motion Lorger stabbed his knife into the tyranid's chest, opening the beast like a fisherman cleaning his catch. The gene stealer howled, but its actions were futile as Lorger ripped it apart, the black knife sizzling as alien blood evaporated. Then, the blood of the prophet, who calls upon these dark powers, Lorger turned the blade on himself, slashing his hand open and allowing his blood to drip on the base of the altar. And finally, the blood of the chosen, that our power grow ever stronger. The demon Primarch turned to the Chaos Marine dressed in black, and just as he had killed the gene stealer, he now sliced open the traitor Astartes. There was a pause as the Space Marine died, his blood flowing to the altar and mixing with that of the Tyranid and Lorger. Finally, a shimmer overtook the altar and the bodies, both glowing before they dissolved into a cloud of warp energy. Korax could feel a chill stabbing into every muscle in his body. He stopped his struggles for a moment, watching in morbid fascination at what took place before him, until all that remained of the altar and the bodies was a single glowing mark in the center of the room, one that Korax had to shy away from even as a primarch. The tenth gate opens, my sons, Lorger cried, raising his hands to the ceiling. Soon, we shall show the Imperium the truth of what we stand for, and all shall bow before our great altar. The surviving traitors cheered, raising their weapons towards the ceiling while Lorger continued. Return to the rest of your brothers. There is still more to do here to prepare for the death of the hive mind. The word bearers nodded, forming up around one of the apparent leaders as he opened a warp portal while Lorger approached Korax. Do you see, brother? Lorger asked. The power I serve is beyond the petty constraints of the hive mind and your emperor. I would show you more, but as you said, you tire of speaking to me. Korax stayed silent, even as Lorger glided past him and headed down the hall. I will leave you here to think on what has transpired. Who knows, perhaps you will begin to see things my way. And with that the demon Primarch was gone, leaving Korax alone with a glowing rune. He tried to break free once more, but even with Lorger gone the stone held firm. What is he playing at? Korax mused. Empress if you can hear me, we are all in grave danger. Despair. It hung in the air like smoke as Matthias and the Valhallans passed through the makeshift defensive line along the river Rin. Guardsmen that had once been happily chatting over their impending victory stared silently ahead, their eyes blank and unfocused. Many were injured, nursing cut arms and torn faces while other had to be helped about on broken if not severed legs. Even the commissars seemed dour, standing quietly to the side rather than stepping up to enforce discipline and morale among the rank and file. And then there were the civilians. Matthias lost track of how many he saw, all wandering listlessly through the ranks. Some were just like the guardsmen, staring blankly ahead as they tried to make sense of what they had witnessed, while other wept with one another as they mourned for lost loved ones. Some tried to come to Matthias for comfort, only to shy away as they spotted the silver eye of the Inquisition marking his robes and armor. While he would not say it outwardly, Matthias wished they would come to him. Ahead, he could see the cobbled together collection of tents and storage containers that made the field hospital. Bianca was easy to spot, her white armor standing out against the gray and drab of her surroundings. She was tending to a heavily pregnant civilian, checking a readout on her Narthesium before speaking. Your blood pressure is a bit elevated, she said. But you and your child are otherwise fine. Thank you, my lady. The pregnant woman said, giving Bianca a teary smile. After all we've lost, I couldn't imagine losing my baby. The Empress' hand is upon you, and will not let your child die. Bianca replied, turning to put away her supplies before the civilian spoke again. Please, my lady, she said, taking Bianca's arm. I, if you are checking, can you look for my husband? His name is Ronaldo, he's a farmer and a good man. WW we were separated during the crossing, but he could not be far from here. I will do what I can to find your husband. Bianca replied, placing the woman's hands back. Go and rest. You need not fear for you or your child's lives tonight. The woman nodded, 
tears still streaming down her cheeks as she made her way out of the field hospital. Matias stepped aside and watched her go, waiting for her to be out of earshot before turning to Bianca. I did not have the heart to tell her, Bianca said. I could not tell her that I found her husband an hour ago. He died of shock from a devourer wound shortly after he was brought to me. Bianca hung her head, her hand flexing as she sighed. I am doing all I can, but I am one hospitaler against the tide. I'm sure you have saved many lives tonight, Matias started, but Bianca shook her head. Eighteen million souls would say otherwise. There was a lengthy pause before Bianca looked back up at Matias. But my work is never done, is it? How have you been, Matias? I could be better. Matias crossed to a nearby crate and sat down, the metal creaking slightly before continuing. Alexis, Nikolai, stand guard and don't let anyone interrupt us. Yes, Lord Matias. Nikolai replied, the two taking up station at the front of the tent. Matias, I have patience to tend to, Bianca said, frowning. What is it that's so important that you have to sequester yourself here? Matias remained silent for several moments. His mind bounced between topics, that of Bianca's apparent resurrection or that the Empress' chosen student was probably a Xenos. Either one would only create more problems. We spoke with the sisters just before I came here, Matias said, looking up at Bianca. They said you died and were brought back to life. Bianca hesitated, her hands clenching again. The hospitaler shuffled on her feet, as if waiting for Matias to continue. I, I am not quite sure what happened to me, she said finally, releasing some of the tension in her body. I was hit by a mutant, and took significant spinal and internal injuries in the process. A less protected soul would probably have died, but somehow I survived. She shivered. After that it's rather hazy. I remember the sisters carrying me through the city, my legs falling numb, the darkness she hesitated again, Matthias taking the opportunity to speak again. So you really did die? He asked. Having never died before, I cannot say Bianca shook her head. Not that I would wish to experience it again. Whatever happened, I, I remember a bright light, and a sudden warmth that came over me. I could breathe again, feel my legs again, and she paused. And there was Rebecca, a golden Narthosium strapped to her arm and her sisters praising her as a saint. I don't think the poor girl handled it well, that's why she's not here with me right now, but I am half tempted to believe it. Matthias remained silent. So it was true then, and Rebecca was a saint of some sort. The Ordo Hereticus and the Ecclesiarchy would be pleased to hear of that development provided, of course, they did not cry in outrage at what else Matthias knew. I suppose today has been full of surprises, hasn't it? Matthias asked. Perhaps Bianca replied, one eyebrow raised. Is there something else you wish to discuss? Matthias hesitated again. His hands clenched, the left one clicking as metal ground against metal, and he found himself fighting the urge to chew his lip. Just get it over with. We had some assistance getting back to friendly lines, he started. Eldar, Harlequins even. Eldar, here? Bianca asked, eyes widening. Should we alert the Astartes? I don't think they have the numbers to be a threat to us physically, at least, Matthias sighed before continuing. While they brought us here, they took us to this place that showed us memories, our memories. I saw some of Terra's and he stopped, choking on the words. And what? Bianca asked. Terra's real name is Twilight, and she is a Xenos. There was a lengthy pause, Bianca regarding Matthias for several moments. Finally, she scowled. Really, Matthias? She started. Terra is a Xenos? She looks human enough to me. I don't know how, but I think it involves powerful sorcery, sorcery only the Empress or someone close to her power could wield. Matthias rose. Think about it, Bianca. She knew nothing of war until she met us, even when she was a student of the Empress of Mankind, she speaks a language that has been dead for nearly 5,000 years, wields psychic powers that somehow break through the shadow of the warp, and the Eldar addressed her with a formal title like she was some kind of legend among them. Doesn't that make you the least bit suspicious that maybe she isn't human? There are thousands of planets that are at peace in the Imperium, Matthias, Bianca countered, eyes narrowing. And as a student of the Empress, perhaps she is more learned in some manners than any other psyker you have met. And are you telling me you trust the vision of an Eldar? That's the thing with psychic visions, Bianca, Matthias turned away. The false ones always have some detail out of place, because try as they might the caster cannot read the entire soul of their target. This one, though? The inflections, the tone, the scale of time that passed, all of it was too perfect to be a hoax. It was just like the visions the Empress showed us when she revealed herself back on Terra, Bianca said nothing, Matthias still keeping his back to her. 
Even if your theory is true, Bianca said. What good does it do anyone? If she is a servant of the Empress, then she is an ally we can trust. She is still a Xenos, Matthias hissed, turning back towards Bianca. Even if she serves the Imperium, it will always be for her goals and wishes, not for mankind's. There will come a point when she will be forced to choose between us and her own beliefs, and... Matthias, you sound like Marcos, Bianca snapped. Terra is a good woman who will do anything to help those who are in need. She is a student of the Empress for throne's sake. Are you going to accuse the God Empress of plotting against her own people? Matthias' jaw tightened as Bianca continued. I always respected you, Matthias, because you were unlike any Inquisitor I have ever met. You did not make rash accusations, or callously gun down civilians to suit your paranoia, you investigated and then acted, as a true servant of the Imperium should. Now you go on about Terra being a Xenos, and you sound like just another hot-headed zealot readying himself to jump in front of a heavy bolter. The difference now is that I'm right about this. Matthias replied. So were they until I watched their hearts stop in my hands. Matthias sputtered, trying to think of a good way to continue forward. Bianca had to understand, had to know that Twilight was dangerous wasn't she? Finally, he sighed and hung his head. I know I sound like some ridiculous zealot, he said. But I can't just ignore this information, Bianca. Maybe Twilight is not out to destroy us, and maybe the Empress vouches for her. He looked up. But there's still a small chance that I am right, and I cannot ignore that. I am sure. Bianca replied. And perhaps you are right, but I have seen too much good in that woman to believe she would ever willingly betray us. If nothing else, you should speak to her and the Empress to make sure all is well before you start tossing out baseless accusations like this, Matthias said nothing, but Bianca's gaze softened as she continued. You are a good man, Matthias, just be sure you do not follow the same path thousands of others have died upon having achieved nothing. I'm not even sure what path I follow now, Matthias said, looking out across the makeshift camp. The civilian crowds had been corralled, guardsmen leading them to more permanent shelters while other soldiers took up the night's watch. It was a tenuous grasp, sure enough, despair still radiating from the soldiers as they marched to their stations. And somewhere in that morass of men and machines was a saint, and a human with the soul of a naive Xenos. And as before, Matthias was at a loss. Chapter 2.10, The Jaws of Cetus, Swarm. The Tyranid Swarm rolled over the hills of Rin's world, the Ravenwing darting back and forth to blunt the attack and allow their brothers time to regroup. Fighters and speeders swooped down to bombard the roiling waves of gaunts and warriors, ragged holes allowing bikers to plunge in and slay several of their command beasts before pulling back out again. Clockwork hit and run attacks, just as the Dark Angels and their descendants had executed countless times before. But they still found their numbers thinning, small handfuls of unforgiven lost among the never-ending swarm. Ramiel and his squadron crashed into the swarm, his power axe carving through three of the Xenos and sending a fourth into a death spin. The weight of the bikes meant they could pass through with ease, the frail aliens doing little to slow them down as they swept through to separate their leading Turbagon from the rest of the swarm. Ramiel sideswiped one warrior attempting to rally the swarm, gunning his engine as he prepared to lead his brothers back out of the mass of Tyranids. The Turbagon is isolated, he shouted. Bring it down now, before it spawns more of its brood. The Ravenwing surged forward, bolters and plasma talons blazing as they focused on the Turbagon. The great beast bellowed in pain, sweeping its massive claws at the Ravenwing as they raced past, but to no avail. Smaller gaunts tried to hold off the onslaught, but it was only a matter of time before they too fell as their commander was laid low. A small victory, but Ramiel would take what he could get. What of our numbers? He asked over the Vox as he and his squad pulled out, another Ravenwing unit moving in to take his place. Two of our brothers fell in that last pass, one of the other Ravenwing said. We still have enough for coherency, but perhaps only one more pass before we are of no use. There is always a use for soldiers, Ramiel countered, turning around to face the Tyranids. Prepare for the next strike. We must kill more of their synapse creatures before they can coordinate a full strike on our lord's position. The Ravenwing swung wide, searching for prime targets among the tirades. The swarm had gotten wise to the attacks, pulling more of their larger creatures in and leaving chaff to slow the Ravenwing. As such more of their flying beasts had closed in to attack the Ravenwing fighters, a furious dogfight unfolding above as the bikers plotted their next move. Artillery beasts spotted, my lord. One biker said, pointing at a collection of biovores and exocrines making their way up the field. The great beasts would need time to get their weapons in place, but a quick strike would make sure they remained off balance and would perhaps thin their numbers as well. We shall mark them for the flyers, Ramiel said, bringing his power axe around. 
the swarm is getting too thick for us to break through directly. With me, my brothers. Ramiel gunned his engine once more, racing down the gentle slope and swinging wide around the swarm. The Tyranids did not react right away, some of the gaunts fired small bursts as the Ravenwing sped past, giving the company master a chance to size up the task before him. The artillery creatures continued their slow march, heedless of what the smaller creatures were doing. Some of the lesser Tyranids had parted, either from their alien instincts or concentrated fire from passing land speeders, but it did provide an opening for the Ravenwing as they adjusted their angles. A trap, most likely, but to leave the larger Tyranids untouched would be a greater failure. Ramiel and his fellows plunged into the Tyranids, crushing several as they drove towards the artillery beasts. He kept his axe up, using the bike's weight and speed as a weapon against the lesser creatures, Iker and Broken Kite and flecking his armor as he barreled forward. His first target, a biovore, had little time to turn towards him before he was upon it, his axe swinging down towards its head. A wet crunch, and the decapitated monstrosity was left to flail about as the company master blitzed through the Xenos lines. His fellows were quick to work, chain swords and combat blades flashing out to carve a bloody swath through the hordes of Cetus. Ramiel swept his bike around, searching for a new target among the hordes. The biovores and exocrines had sped up, lesser creatures swarming forward to block the Dark Angel's path. He opened up with his bike's plasma talon, blue bolts of superheated plasma streaking forward to punch through the protective carapace of another biovore. The beast stumbled and fell, crushing several gaunts in its fall as Ramiel gunned his engine and raced for extraction, his squadron racing after him. That was the plan, but reality turned against the Dark Angels. Surging around the flank was another swarm of Tyranids, led by a truly massive specimen armed with four bone sabers. The leader beast bellowed, a psychic tremor flowing through the air as the Tyranids fell down among the Ravenwing. They're threatening to cut us off, are they? Ramiel asked. Faster, brothers. Deny these Xenos the satisfaction of victory. The Ravenwing surged forward, skirting between the two swarms as they raced for extraction. Fighters swooped down to bombard the newly arrived horde, but the leader proved to be surprisingly fast as it raced towards the bikers. Ramiel angled around, placing himself between the swarm lord and his brothers. The beast sized him up for a moment, twirling its blades as Ramiel raised his axe in challenge. The engagement need not be long, just long enough to allow his brothers to escape and perhaps wound the great beast. If I am to die today, he said. I shall not be found wanting. With that, he gunned his engine and charged, the swarmlord bringing two of its blades forward into a blocking position while drawing back with the others. A lesser man would have seen nothing, just a flash as Astartes and Tyranid clashed. Ramiel's skill was considerable, his strike biting deep into the chitinous armor of the swarmlord, but was not enough to gravely wound the beast. The swarmlord's retaliation was quick and decisive, the first bone saber taking off Ramiel's arm and head while the second bisected the bike lengthwise, the vehicle exploding soon after as the swarmlord marched onward, eager to reap a greater harvest upon the humans that dared oppose it. All that remained in its path was one more predator. Twilight made her way further into the camp, flanked by sisters Veronica and Ruth. Ahead, she could see Mirshan, Matthias, and a few other officers from the Cadian and Catechan regiments all of them huddled over a map of the city. Mirshan appeared to be the only one to notice Twilight, stepping aside to greet her as she approached. I had been meaning to speak to you about your well-being, Miss Tara, he said. But the tides of war have called me elsewhere. I know what that's like, Twilight nodded. But it's good to see you alive, Mirshan. The Forgefather nodded, ushering Twilight towards the table. Only Matthias seemed to notice her arrival, giving her a look of fear? Why was he scared of her? Oh dear, did I do something wrong? We are all assembled. Mirshan said. Now, we can plan our defense. Such as it is, the Cadian officer said, looking down at the map. With Lord General Hirsch dead and most of our forces depleted, we have maybe half a million guardsmen to hold against several magnitudes more Tyranids and almost no way to send to Lord Nevers for help. In simplest terms, we're all dead men, the Catechan officer said. The only matter to consider now is how long we can make the Tyranids choke on our bones while the Empress and Primarch strike down the beasts for good. There has to be more than that, Twilight said. Humanity has thrown back greater enemies with fewer numbers before. Surely we might have a chance of holding. She is not wrong, Mirshan said. This city itself has held against unbeatable odds, the Crimson Fists and the Rinsguard held for 18 months against a full orc horde with only a few dozen survivors total. The Crimson Fists didn't have their charges stab them in the back the same way ours did. The Cadian replied. Maybe we have more numbers, but our morale is at rock bottom. 
Any concentrated assault from the Tyranids will shatter what little we have and lead us to be hunted down like vermin in the hills. Perhaps you just need a little more faith. Twilight offered. The Empress is on her way, I know it. The Primarchs would not abandon us so readily to our fates. And we have a saint among our camp now, all of this is cause to have hope that we will win the day. Hope is the first step on the path to disappointment. The Catechon said. And having no hope is to be a slave to despair, Twilight snapped, clenching her hands together. I've been serving alongside you soldiers for months, years even, and I just see the same thing over and over again. You fall away, you resign yourself to dying gloriously instead of actually fighting to win, and in the end what does that achieve? Nothing. The Tyranids break through, kill us all, and we die having achieved nothing. We do not want to delude our soldiers into thinking they are destined for victory, the Cadian officer said. That leads to men taking reckless actions and the belief they are invincible, and when they are proven wrong the damage is far more than if they had just acted with discipline. And died without meaning? Twilight interrupted. I'm sorry, but we have the knowledge and skill to rally these men and women, and you just seem ready to throw it away in some pointless last stand. Quiet, both of you, Matthias snapped, both guard officers and Twilight falling silent as the Inquisitor continued. Bickering like this will get us into our graves faster than I'm sure most of us would like. Perhaps Terra is right and we shouldn't give up hope of winning the day, but the simple truth is that many guardsmen and Astartes will die to get there some of us probably will be among that number. Twilight swallowed but said nothing more as Matthias looked to the map. I'm no master of grand strategy, he started. But we do at least hold a reasonable defense against the Tyranids with the river between us. For what good it will do us? The Cadian officer said. The Tyranids hold the sky, and most of their more vicious strains can swim better than they have any right to. The river can buy us a few hours, I suppose, but we will lose the banks under concentrated assault. If we have spare Prometheum we can possibly set the river alight, Mirshan offered. It is a temporary solution, but it might yet buy us some time. It's not like our tanks are going to be doing any extensive maneuvers against the Tyranids here. The Catechon officer muttered. I'll see what we can do. My brothers and I still have a sizable force in the area, Mirshan continued. And we still have a few attack aircraft armed and accounted for. We can anchor your defensive line and provide a wall to slow the Tyranids for your strikes. I don't suppose asking you to direct the defense will go anywhere? We Astartes know our limits, and the truth is that limit is not your own. Mirshan looked around the table. I do not wish for a situation where I may force you into actions that you physically and spiritually cannot complete. I doubt it will come to that, but that the possibility is there. How can I help? Twilight asked. The guard officers regarded her for a moment, Matthias looking away while Mirshan studied the map. Didn't Lord Hirsch have you working on some kind of retreat for the civilians if the need arose? The Cadian asked. Yes, Twilight said. I'm pretty sure all my notes have been destroyed, but I can work up a new plan to make sure the defense of the river lasts as long as possible. She looked at the map. You'll probably want your heaviest defenses moved towards the central spire, to start. That island can be used as a good staging point for a large-scale assault across the river and save the Tyranids time they'd waste on trying a direct ford at another point. Maybe a few squads to hold it in case the Tyranids try a crossing there? Out of the question, the Cadian said. Several of my men crossed the river at the spire. All of them reported disturbances. Tyranid influence, perhaps? Mirshan asked. The spire is where I checked for genestealer influence when we first arrived, Matthias said. It's a prime location, given its position and the vantage it gives over the city, but I found no sign of cultist activity on that island. It is an alien. The Cadian officer said quickly. The soldiers described it like standing and looking up at the gate for longer than was necessary. The others fell silent, twilight looking back and forth between them all. All save Mirshan had shifted back to a state of fear, though this seemed more primal than merely fighting the Tyranids. What's the gate? She asked. The Cadian gate, the only calm space between the Imperium and the Eye of Terror, Mirshan said. I saw it once when I was but a neophyte of the Salamanders. The transition from reality to chaos is unsettling. He looked to the guard officers. If there is a stronger warp presence there it could deter the Tyranids as well. Or draw them further in, given how those abominations cancel out the warp. The Cadian countered. Either way, I don't want anything to do with that spire. I'd raise it if we didn't have a limited number of basilisks, but we have to prepare for a fight there nonetheless. It is the narrowest point of the river Twilight said. Okay, I think I've got it. Give me a few minutes to write up a plan and then you can send out your orders. I'll be there to assist Mirshan with the defense and help in case anything starts to go wrong. Actually, Terra, Matthias said. 
I think it would be best if you stay out of this fight for as long as possible. Twilight looked up at Matthias, one eyebrow raised. The Inquisitor was as stern as ever when it came to discussing tactics, but his gaze was cold. Far too cold for him. It was like Marcos had somehow come back from the dead and replaced Matthias. I can take care of myself, Matthias, Twilight started. I'm not the scared girl I was on Caesarea, and I can't correct everything from the relative safety of a command post like this, things just happen way too fast when it comes to Tyranids. And in any other situation I would agree, but this is different. Things will go wrong, and the last thing we need is for you to Matthias appeared to choke on his words. The last thing we need is for you to get swept away in the swarm. That'd destroy whatever morale these men and women still had in an instant. Matthias, what's wrong? She asked, stepping around the table towards him. You haven't worried about me like this since Caesarea. Why the sudden concern? Matthias looked first to Mirshan, then back to Terra. Twilight fought the urge to chew her lip as she waited for Matthias to speak, dozens of bad permutations running in her mind. Can we talk about this later? He asked. It really isn't anything that needs to be mentioned here. Twilight frowned, but at least some of the tension went away. If you say so, Matthias, she said, backing away. But I am going to fight with the others, and I don't want to sound too rude, but there isn't too much you can do to stop me. Matthias remained stern, his gaze growing colder still, but at least he gave a nod of agreement. Do you two need a moment? The Catechan officer asked. We have other duties to attend to and morale to see about, so if you need to discuss other matters we can reconvene when Lady Terra has finished her defense plan. I think that would be wise. Mirshan said. I will keep an eye on these two while you prepare. The two guardsmen saluted and exited, stepping around the waiting sisters while Twilight looked to Matthias. Okay Matthias, what's wrong? She asked. You haven't been the same since you shot up that path with the Eldar. Eldar? Mirshan asked. I did not know there were Eldar here. How else would we have gotten back from the spaceport? Matthias said, moving around to put the table between him and Twilight. But they seem to be on our side for the most part. You saw something on that path, Matthias, something about me I think, her gaze softened. Was it something I did? Please, tell me and we can work it out. Tara, I Matthias looked between her and Mirshan. This really isn't the time to be discussing these things. Perhaps when the Empress arrives, then we can talk this over. But Matthias before Twilight could finish, Matthias was already making his way to the exit. Matthias, wait, please. She stepped up to stop him before a green hand rested on her shoulder. Best to let him go, Miss Tara, Mirshan said. Sometimes it is best not to press against such sore wounds, but allow them to heal at their own pace. Twilight bit back a reply, watching as Matthias disappeared among the guard. Finally she sighed, her shoulders sagging before she spoke. I've dealt with people hiding things from me before she started. Only now that it's something I might have caused, I want a chance to make amends, but he's not giving me that chance. You are a wise young woman, Miss Tara. I have no doubt you will succeed in relieving your tensions with the Inquisitor. Mirshan looked away towards the river. Though perhaps after we defeat these Tyranids, and perhaps after we make sure the Eldar presence is not a true threat. I look forward to fighting alongside you at the river. Yes, of course. Twilight nodded. Though, I'd rather we had some time of peace, really. It feels like I've been shuffled from one war zone to the next without much chance for rest. Such is the nature of where we live. Mirshan replied. Though I too would welcome a chance of peace. It has been some time since I have a chance to visit my home on Prometheus Twilight found herself giving Mirshan a sad smile. Well, we can get through this day together, she said. For our friends, and our families. Of course. Mirshan said. Now, you will need some time to prepare our defenses. Perhaps I can help with making sure my brothers and I are best deployed. Of course, I'd love the help. The Sanguinium Martyrs had withdrawn to the Umbra of Rin's world for repairs, leaving the heaviest of the fighting to the Dark Angels as they did their best to keep the space around the planet secure. The Inquisitorial Cruiser hung quietly in space, small service craft and repair ships flitting about as they patched up Rens in armor, dismantled gun batteries, and shield generators. Most systems had been powered down, making the ship all but invisible to the naked eye as it drifted. In the center of it all, Angelique slumbered. She lay on her back, restrained by several heavy belts tied across her bed. A psychic dampener had been clamped around her head, calibrated at higher than normal levels to make sure her powers did not go haywire with a high fleet so close. Two sentry guns and a squad of stormtroopers were her only companions, the soldiers watching carefully for any signs of danger coming from the psyker. Still, Angelique slumbered. 
and dreamt. She saw a black field, scorched from countless fires and the might of the sun. The light stood among the field, drawing power to itself as it stood against the darkness. The darkness had a name, a fell name Angelique could only grasp at, but doing so left the taste of sulfur within her mind. She saw them all, a million minds screeching into the black, eager to devour the lion and the mare. Their claws were blunted, and the drake would awake from the ash, the path of the sun bloodied by the life of good and evil men. She saw the betrayed, falling down within the darkness, teeth closing as it was given flesh. The darkness name was a fell name, and it smote the light and the million minds for the mare to step forward. The mare had a flower clutched in her teeth, its petals stained with blood, and the pillar collapsed around the eye and snow. The darkness had a name. And in that moment, it looked into Angelique. And she mumbled, rolling her head back and forth. One of the soldiers spotted this, reaching for his last gun as he rose from his spot. The psyker said something, he said. She might be waking up. We may have to drug her again, the sergeant said. The last thing we need is for her to freak out and draw the tyranids to us. All of it ends Angelique said. The darkness rises from the pit to make war against the light, and the mare shall strike the dragon. Call a medique, the sergeant said. We need her to quiet down now. Angelique moaned, rolling her head back and forth again. The darkness spoke, a fell word Angelique could not speak, and the children of the dragon rose to the mare. The drake and the serpent fought while the sun slumbered, and I closed while the mare stepped into the light. The word was spoken, and Angelique screamed. Dawn. Crimson sunlight cut across the waters of the river Rin, turning the water to the color of blood. The imperial soldiers had taken their positions, a solid line of green standing before them as the salamanders readied themselves for the battle to come. Tanks and heavy guns watched the far bank, tracking the growing swarm of tyranids as they amassed for a crossing. Twilight had asked they hold off their fire for now. Better to draw them in and perhaps stall their charge rather than betray their position fully. She stood within the salamanders' ranks, peeking over a barricade at the other side of the river. The sisters were with her, huddled down behind the wall as they readied their bolters and flamers. They had not spoken much since the night before, doing their best to rest in preparation for the final stage of the battle for New Rin City. Twilight had wanted to say more, just to alleviate their fears, but nothing had come of it. We are in position, Miss Terra, Twilight looked to Mirshan as he returned from the other end of the salamander's line. The forge father was armed with a flaming spear longer than she was tall, the weapon resting against his shoulder as he continued. You are nervous, no? Yes, I am Twilight said, giving a small nod. Before all this, I always felt that I had something secure to fall back to. Now she looked back across the river, watching as a hive tyrant stalked along the bank closest to the spire. This is it. We win, or we die. We will win today, Tara, Ruth said, resting a hand on Twilight's shoulder. The Empress guides your mind and blade, and she has not failed us yet. Then why am I still scared? Twilight thought. Her hands tightened, the metal of her armor scraping against the hilt of her sword, and she had to fight the urge to swallow. Together, we can hold this line. Mirshan said. The guard will stand, but I do fear that feelings of despair have set in. You should speak to them. What? Twilight asked, looking back to the Forge Father. I'm not much for public speaking. I don't even have any notes. The greatest sermons are those given from the heart, Tara, Ruth said. Speak, and the Empress will provide the words for you. Twilight began to sweat. Suddenly facing down a ravenous horde of tyranids did not seem all that bad, if it meant she got to avoid the dread of impromptu public speaking. But then this was not taking over for Celestia or Mayor Mare when they weren't around to be master of ceremonies for one event or another, this was life and death, thousands if not millions of soldiers waiting for some words of wisdom from their leaders so they could prepare for battle. If she just stayed silent, what did that say about the Empress' favored student? Okay, she said softly, turning away from the river and passing through the assembled ranks of Astartes, she made her way up the hill, Ruth calling the other sisters to join them as they closed to the guard lines. They all still had the same weary expressions as they did the day before, even with their officers and commissars looking over their shoulders. Twilight was half tempted to just turn around and forget about this, but she found herself walking onward. You have to do this, Twilight, a voice that sounded very close to Rainbow Dash's said. They're depending on you. Twilight stopped before the assembled ranks, placing a hand against her throat and channeling a little magic forward. Hello? Can everyone hear me? She asked, her voice echoing for a moment as the warp enhanced it. This did catch the guards' attention, though many were still focused on the far bank and the massing tyranids. Many of you have probably never seen me, but I am Terra, 
student of the Empress. I she hesitated, trying to think of the right words to say. I wanted to speak to you, not as a student or a leader, but as a soldier, as one ready to stand with you against everything that comes against us. Three years ago, I probably would have been much like you are now, scared, doubtful, tired. We stand against a great enemy today, and with all that we've been through there's good reason to have some doubts. She heard a murmur of conversation behind her followed by a metallic clang, but decided to push on regardless. But though all that, through the loss and misfortune, I have never lost hope. Twilight found her hand falling to her sword, closing around the hilt as she continued. For I have seen a greater power than anything these bugs can bring against us. I have seen a light that burns within the hearts of every man and woman that stands here today, and still smolders within your souls. This did catch some of the guardsmen's attention, a number of them pulling themselves up straighter as she continued. That light is the spirit of humanity, the spirit of those that have come before us to build the Imperium to what it is today. It is the spirit by which the Empress returned to lead the Imperium again, and it is the light that will guide her to us in our hour of need. It is the spirit that time and again has overthrown monsters and tyrants who would see you, your friends, your loved ones die for their petty amusement, and it is the spirit that will let us stand firm again and again. She drew her sword, pointing it across the river. Are you going to give them the satisfaction of snuffing that spirit out? She asked, her voice rising. They have not witnessed the Empress in her power and glory. They have not fought for friends and family, or anything worth fighting for for that matter. They have no grasp of a greater cause beyond themselves, and that makes them nothing but pathetic weaklings. We have seen the Empress and all she intends for the galaxy. We have stood side by side for the freedom of our kind, the life of every man, woman, and child that cannot stand on their own. We have stood against the tide and risen above it, and we will continue to stand against it because our spirit cannot be quenched. Our friendships cannot be broken. We are the light of humanity made manifest, and when the Empress arrives she will find that light shining bright, for we shall not be broken. This drew a few cheers, twilight turning fully to face the Tyranids. Come on, you stupid alien insects, she shouted, her voice ringing off the buildings. Come over here and die, for that's all you're good for anyway. You will burn in the fires of humanity, and when the ashes clear all will see that we stood firm. We claimed victory. We are the soldiers of Rin's world, the spirit of humanity, and you are nothing compared to U.S. More cheers, and Twilight lowered her sword as she caught her breath. Reality rushed back to her, her hands quivering as her adrenaline died down. Did I really just tell a giant swarm of ravenous alien insects to come and get us? Yes, yes I did. And it felt so good. Tara, are you all right? Ruth asked, coming up to Twilight. Yes, Twilight said, shaking her head after a pause. I, I never thought I'd get all worked up like that I guess I just needed a moment to collect my thoughts. Well, you may wish to collect them faster, Naomi said, readying her combi flamer. The Tyranids got your message and are preparing to cross the river. Twilight looked. Sure enough, the Tyranid swarm had reached critical mass, a number of scout organisms plunging into the shallower waters of the river Rin as their larger handlers prepared to cross. Flights of gargoyles and crones swooped between the buildings of the southern half of the city, shrieking as they flapped onward towards the defiant imperials. Don't worry, girls, Twilight said, bringing her sword up as purple flames danced along the blade. We've got each other, and the best in the galaxy at our backs. They've already lost they just need to learn that fact. The imperials had braced themselves along a string of hills, Johnson and his dark angels taking the center while other space marine chapters and the remaining loyal guard regiments anchored the flanks. The swarm struck from all sides, a great tide of creatures crashing against the unforgiven while swifter elements fell in among the rest of the defenders. The air sang with the sound of battle and carnage, the roar of thousands of alien beasts matched only by the thunder of millions of bolters, cannons, and rockets striking against the swarm. The dead of all sides piled around their boots, the ground growing muddy from spilled blood and alien ichor. The lion stayed in the front line, attempting to keep the attention of the hive mind on himself. Then, they would know true power. Johnson fell in among another swarm of tyranid warriors, his sword whistling as it cut through the air and into the first of his victims. The tyranid fell headless, the lion not pausing as he buried the sword up to the hilt in the stomach of a second. He lunged forward, shoulder checking a third as he pulled his sword free, the wide arc of his swing opening a fourth's belly open with ease. The last one standing received an unceremonious boot to the gut, Johnson stomping down to crush its chest to paste. The lesser tyranids knew well enough to avoid him swinging wide as the lion searched for new prey to hunt. A tyranid prime let out one final hiss before the lion split it from head to toe, the primarch not even slowing as he crushed its body beneath his boots. 
he and the Deathwing were once more the tip of the spear, a score of dead Tyranids lying at their feet as they stabbed, bludgeoned, and gunned down everything that dared to come against them. Such had been their situation for the last hour, the Tyranids showing no sign of slowing. Keep your focus on me, Xena's filth. He growled, bringing his sword up once more. I am all that you fear, not the guard nor my sons. Do not continue to toy with me. The hive mind made no response, so Johnson plunged back into the carnage to keep their attention. Every strike of his sword found a body, every cut and stab of blade new prey, and the mightiest of the tyranid swarm were nothing more than chaff before the lion's fury. He pulled back, just enough to allow the Deathwing to catch up to him. The bone-armored Terminators said nothing as they formed up around their Primarch, storm bolters clattering while knights locked up their shields. How do we stand? He asked. The line holds, my lord, a voice called through his vox. The Tyranids are bringing up their artillery beasts, and we have unconfirmed sightings of at least one Bio-Titan approaching. It will not matter. Johnson replied. Order the guard to increase their bombardment, and bring forward more tank destroyers if the Bio-Titans do make an appearance. We will hold the line. Yes, my lord. Johnson closed the link, just as another swarm of Tyranids darted forward. These gaunts merely fired a burst of organic firepower before darting back, ducking and weaving to avoid as much return fire as possible. The Deathwing held, the storm shields of the knights holding firm while the regular Terminators tore into the swarm. Johnson remained resolute, taking a moment to clean his sword in preparation of the next true assault. Over the ranks came greater beasts. Zoanthropes, the brain-like Xenos snaking through the air on currents of psychic energy while a flock of gargoyles shielded them from concentrated firepower. Bring down those beasts, he shouted. Flak missiles and fragmentation rounds, ten degrees forward. There was a faint cry over the Vox as the lion's orders were relayed, devastators and guard heavy weapons teams adjusting their aim to target the oncoming swarm. A pause, and then the air before the Deathwing filled with shrapnel and smoke, dozens of gargoyles and at least one zoanthrope reeling as the Imperials reaped their harvest. Some survived, three zoanthropes bunched up, the air between them shimmering as the creatures pooled together their psychic energy. Brace, Johnson cried, digging in his heels as a green lance blossomed between the aliens and his lines. Four Deathwing knights cried out before the powers of the hive mind ripped them to shreds, broken armor and weapons scattering as the lance blasted through them like a sword through paper. The lesser Tyranids seized upon this gap and surged forward, a score of them rushing through and piling upon the Deathwing as they worked to reform their lines. The sudden rush overwhelmed several more veterans, three more ceasing to struggle as the swarms of Cetus poured onward. Johnson growled as he dove back into the scrum, crushing several Tyranids under his weight before he even swung. Many more died in his first strike, the force of impact lifting their shredded bodies into the air as the lion pressed onward. Blood and shards of chitin clung to him, running down his armor in bloody rivers as he and the Deathwing retaliated. The zoanthropes did not let up, releasing another warp blast among the Terminators and punching another hole for the swarm to enter. Reform the line, Johnson bellowed. Heavy weapons, strike down those zoanthropes. All Deathwing, rally to my position. Assault and plasma cannons ripped into the swarm. Tyranids shrieking as the Deathwing lines reformed. One of the zoanthropes burst from a direct hit from a last cannon, chunks of shredded meat and brain matter splattering the swarm as it rushed below. Cetus pressed onward, Johnson shielding his eyes as another one of his sons popped from the concentrated warp energy, the red blood of men rushing into the river of alien ichor that already stained his armor. He would not relent, even as a true challenger approached. It was a hive tyrant, towering over the swarm as it urged the lessers forward. It was armed with four swords, bioelectricity crackling around the blades as the beast strode towards the Dark Angels. It spotted the lion among the space marines, bellowing before a new wave of tyranids came rushing towards him. You think to slow me with your lessers? The lion asked. Cowardly creature. Witness the might of Caliban. The terminators braced, the tide of Xenos crashing into them as the lion stepped up. Each strike hewed apart dozens of tyranids, Johnson using wild strikes to clear a path before him. The leader circled nearby, eyeing the lion as more of its minions threw themselves against the imperial wall. The lion cut down another swath of gaunts, taking his sword in a two-handed grip as he eyed the leader. The swarmlord did not seem ready or willing to commit to a charge, continuing to stalk about the edge of the fight as it sized up the primarch. Johnson did not move, waiting for the beast to make the first strike lest he overstep himself and get cut off. The Deathwing and the lesser Tyranids continued their melee, spurred on by the impending clash between their leaders. The earth trembled, Johnson taking a few steps back as he kept his eye on the swarmlord. Soon enough, two trigons burst from the ground, 
lunging into the Deathwing lines with a roar. Attacked from two fronts the Terminators began to give way, smaller gaps opening up within the lines as the Space Marines moved to deal with the new threat. The lion darted forward and brought his sword down on the back of the nearest Trigon, splitting off a large chunk of its hide while the rest of his sons moved for the kill. The beast thrashed about, knocking back several Deathwing knights in the process, but the Terminators pressed in to seal its fate while Johnson turned back to his opponent. Now, the Swarmlord moved. The creature moved far faster than anything its size had any right to, crossing the distance between it and the Deathwing in scant seconds. It whipped its bone sabers about, the two lower ones neatly bisecting a trio of Terminators that stood in its path, the Swarmlord calmly striding over them as it advanced on the lion. A swarm of gaunts followed behind, the beast ushering them forward to attack both Primarch and Astartes before it lunged into the fray. The lion cared not for the lesser beasts. All that mattered now was the leader. The Swarmlord brought all four of its sabers down, the lion quickly twisting his blade around to block. No sooner had the weapons made contact did the Swarmlord draw two back, its lower arms thrusting forward to gut Johnson as he blocked the higher attack. Johnson sidestepped and brought his sword down, sparks flying as steel and bones scraped along one another and the sabers were deflected away. The Swarmlord hissed and swept out with its upper arms, Johnson ducking down as the bone sabers passed harmlessly over his head. Johnson stabbed upward, aiming his blade for the Swarmlord's chest. The beast swatted the blade with contemptuous ease, smacking the flats of two of its weapons into the lion's side. Johnson stumbled to the right, sweeping his sword down to redirect another duo of stabs before jumping back to dodge another set of strikes from the right. He drew back before chopping towards the beast's head, but two sabers were enough to catch his blade and leave him open to attack. Again the lion dodged left, one bone saber scraping across his armor from a near miss. He dragged his sword along, the swarmlord roaring as the blade tore a gash through chitin and muscle. Instead of trying to strike with its swords, this time the swarmlord merely charged forward, using its massive bulk to barrel over the lion and try to trample him to death. He ducked away again, rolling across the ground as he tried to recover some stability, his sword deflecting the tyranid's tail as it whipped out towards his head. Johnson got back to his feet, just as two bone sabers came down towards his head. He brought his sword up, the Swarmlord's weapons scraping against the blade before Johnson shifted and lunged again. The Swarmlord blocked the strike with its remaining two arms, but it gave Johnson enough time to draw back and bring his weapon into a defensive position. The Swarmlord drew back as well, taking a more open stance as if to bait the lion into a charge. The air around the Swarmlord crackled, psychic energy radiating off the beast before a bolt shot out towards Johnson. He dodged, the warp blast shearing off a piece of his right pauldron before exploding among the mass of space marines and tyranids beyond. Johnson rushed around to the right, hoping to keep the Swarmlord moving and hamper its aim with any further warp powers. The Swarmlord twisted around as the lion charged forward, two of its sabers blocking another chop while green lightning arced down towards the Primarch. Fortunately, it merely skipped across his armor rather than penetrating deeper, but it was enough of a shock to force the Primarch back. Johnson took a few steps back, keeping his sword in front of him as he and the Swarmlord circled. The Tyrant had growled and darted forward, lunging with its lower arms while keeping the upper arms ready for blocking and countering potential attacks. Johnson spun his sword, deflecting the two lower swords before slamming the hilt of his weapon into the beast's chest. A crunch of chitin told him his strike had found purchase, more to annoy the beast than anything. The Tyrant had brought its upper sabers down, the lion slipping out from under the strike before raking his blade across the Swarmlord's side once more. The tyranid monster bellowed, whipping around as Johnson pressed the attack. His sword came down on the Swarmlord's upper right shoulder, sinking deep into flesh and chitin. The Swarmlord thrashed about, Johnson wrenching his sword about in an effort to sever this arm from his opponent. Doing so left him exposed, and he grimaced as a bone saber stabbed into his leg, finally something gave way and his sword was freed, the Swarmlord's arm following soon after. The Swarmlord bellowed again, whipping Johnson in the stomach with its tail in its rage. He stumbled back, his legs trembling as his body worked to patch the wounds he had taken from the monster's weapons. With one arm missing the Swarmlord took a defensive stance, its two lower arms held in front while the third remained back. Johnson brought his sword up, aiming towards the beast's chest once again, waiting for the opportune moment to strike. The Swarmlord struck first, sweeping its remaining upper arm while keeping the lower blades in defense. Johnson deflected the strike easily enough, bringing his sword down quickly to defend from any further strikes. The tyrant attacked with its lower arms, Johnson ducking back and hacking at the blades in the hopes of taking off another of the monster's limbs. The Swarmlord blocked, scissoring its blades to lock Johnson's sword while its third arm stabbed downward. 
Johnson had no time to free his blade, twisting his body to dodge the strike as best he could. He failed, the tyranid saber slashing down his back and rending his armor open. Warm blood poured down his back. He sank down to his knees once he freed his sword, keeping the blade as high as possible as the swarmlord loomed over him. You will not break me, monster. Johnson growled, wiping away a small trickle of blood from his mouth as he pulled himself upright again. The heresy, my brother's betrayal, Caliban, I have weathered them all. You shall not break me this day. The swarmlord sneered, readying its swords as the lion drew his weapon back. With a roar Primarch and Tyron had charged, bringing their weapons down towards their opponent's head. Matthias did not flinch as the Lehman Russ next to him fired, the battle cannon thundering as it launched a high explosive shell downrange. The shell detonated against the carapace of an advancing hive tyrant, the beast bellowing as the strike sent it tumbling into the river. The loss of the synapse creature briefly slowed the swarm, long enough for a second shell and a barrage of heavy bolter shells to reap a terrible toll. Still the swarm pressed on. With no fortification to guard the spire, the Tyranids had taken the island rather easily and were now working to gain a stable foothold on the far bank. Autocannons, bolters, battle cannons, and multilasers were not enough to fully stop Cetus, even as hundreds of Tyranids fell dead into the river, the water already stained greenish-blue from their blood. The salamanders, of course, were taking the brunt of the strike. The Astartes did not hold back, pouring burning Prometheum and bolter fire into the swirling mass of Xenos. Smoke rose from the river as burning husks were cast downstream, though the waves of Tyranids continued to draw closer and closer to the human lines. Currently, Matthias could see Mirshan and his chosen veterans engaged in a vicious melee with a squad of Tyranid warriors that had made the crossing, the Forgefather holding a trio of the monsters at bay while his comrades pulled a wounded brother to safety. And among the mass of green and black that was the Salamanders, Matthias could see Twilight. She shielded the sisters from the worst of the fighting, her hand held high to project a magical dome over herself and a number of other defenders. She herself was already bloodied from the battle, her chest and arms splashed with tyranid blood. Yet she held fast, channeling her power forward despite the overwhelming tyranid presence, even smiling as Ruth sang a battle hymn over the din. She is a Xenos, a voice whispered in Matthias' mind. She will betray you the first chance she gets. Matthias watched Twilight as she battled. She moved with the same jerky movements of any mortal, her hand unwavering as she held up the barrier even as a tyranid prime tore into it with its rending claws. She merely brought her sword around, purple flames following after her in a curtain. She is a Xenos, she will betray you the first chance she gets. Orders, my lord? Nikolai asked from behind Matthias. So busy had he been trying to coordinate the forces and make sure no infiltrators had snuck in, he had yet to properly deploy himself for the battle. Too late for that, I suppose. We'll move up to support the salamanders, Matthias said, drawing his bolt pistol before starting towards the line. Focus fire on the larger beasts and leave the swarms to the Astartes. Yes, my lord. The Valhallans readied their meltaguns, falling in step behind Matthias as he made his way through the lines. Nearby spore mines launched by unseen biovores detonated, bathing unlucky guardsmen in a cloud of noxious gases. Matthias had to press on, heedless of the screams and choked gasps of dying men and women, his focus on the advancing wave of Tyranids and the Astartes holding them at bay and the Xenos maiden leading the battle. She will betray you the first chance she gets. The gap Matthias found formed when a salamander took a glob of bioplasma to the chest. The marine staggered back, clawing at melting ceramide as if flicking the stuff away would do any better. Before the shot could burn through for a kill, Sister Rebecca ducked through the melee, resting a hand against the wound. Do not worry, my lord, she said. I, I don't really know what I'm doing, but this still seems to work. How is he not supposed to worry if you lead in Matthias' thoughts died as he watched a golden glow race down the sister's arm, twisting among the damaged ceramite before pulling back out. The armor was still scarred, but the Astartes himself was totally unharmed. Thank you, little sister, the salamander said. I shall remember your kindness in years to come. Rebecca blushed, helping the space marine back to his feet and handing him his bolter. As the Astartes returned to the fighting, Rebecca spotted Matthias. Oh, Lord Matthias, Rebecca said, blushing again. I did not know you would come to help us. I Matthias hesitated. Of course. I'm no coward to let you all take the worst of the fighting. Matthias readied his pistol. Lead the way. Rebecca nodded and turned back towards the river, unslinging her bolter as she, Matthias, and the Valhallans made their way to the barricade. The riverbank was filled with Tyranids, living and dead. Thousands of gaunts swarmed over the walls, using their fallen brethren for stable footing as they slammed into the salamanders. 
great gouts of red and white fire poured into the swarm, roasting the Xenos as they made their mad dash up to the space marines. Mirshin and his command squad remained outside, the Forgefather sweeping his own flamer across the lines as he retrieved the spear of Vulcan from the skull of a dead Turvagon. The sisters had centered around Twilight, pouring fire down the bank while she herself continued to duel the Tyranid Prime. The beast was almost identical to any other warrior, save perhaps a few extra marks and scars, and its speed and lash whip made it more than a match for Twilight. The whip coiled around her sword, flesh sizzling as purple flames licked against it, while Twilight held a smaller psychic shield to keep the prime sword at bay. Instinct told Matthias to shoot the prime in the head, disrupt its psychic field and focus so a human could come in and kill it. The problem was that its opponent was not human. Matthias. Twilight called, having pulled her sword free and twisted around to spot him. Help me, she said nothing more as the prime charged in, purple sparks flying as its bonesword clashed against Twilight's left arm. The Valhallans plunged in, lending their meltaguns to the sisters' defense, but they would not be able to get a clear shot at the prime without the risk of hitting Twilight. That left Matthias, alone and unengaged. And he still could not act. She will betray you the first chance she gets. Twilight darted forward, lunging at the Tyranid Prime with her sword. The beast batted the weapon away, bringing its whip down where Twilight had been standing, the barbed tips cutting grooves into the ground. She drew back, charging up another blast of magic that the Prime just muscled through. Matthias, please, she cried, blocking another strike from the alien. His hand trembled. All he had to do was shoot elsewhere, or stow his pistol. Anything, and the Xenos posing as a human would die in the galaxy with her. What truly matters in your life, the fate of the Imperium, or your own zealotry? What kind of question is that, Xenos? Matthias raised his pistol and fired, the bolt whistling past Twilight's ear and detonating in the Tyranid's face. The beast screamed as acid and mutagens melted through its carapace down to its brain, Matthias watching as it pulled away to claw pitifully at its head. This gave Twilight the opening she needed, and with a cry she drove her sword up through the Prime's jaw and out through the top of its skull. With a flick she cleaved the Prime's skull in half, stepping back to the defensive line while he corpse toppled away. Okay, I think I overstretched myself there, Twilight mused, bringing her sword down as she continued. Reading Sigismund and Grimaldus before battle probably isn't very conducive for long defense. A charge or other attack, maybe, or maybe I'm just not moderating myself all that much. Twilight looked to Matthias and gave a smile. Thank for the help, Matthias. My pleasure, he said, drawing his sword as he surveyed the battlefield. The Tyranid wave had slacked, even if only a few hundred were charging rather than a few thousand, and Matthias could see larger beasts trudging up the field to bring their weapons to bear. A brief respite and then death, he guessed. But you've probably just damned your soul anyway, he thought. Better to get this over with now rather than drag it out. Celestia's war is within her mind, cutting through the warp as she faces the vast void of the hive mind. She stand before it, a shining beacon of light for all of humanity to bear witness as they two race towards Rin's world. The hive mind is as it always is, formless and alien, crashing against Celestia's might like a wave against the shore. Celestia wavers, but is unbowed. You stand against us. The hive mind rumbles, unleashing another wave of attacks against Celestia. We are the end of all things the unity of all beings. To struggle is to delay the end, the joining of all minds. I stand as I always have, against oblivion for all beings. Celestia counters, drawing more power to herself. In real space, a lone star implodes into a black hole as Celestia draws forth more energy, hurling a great warp blast into the void. The damage is negligible, but it did stem the tide coming against her for a few moments. I am the morning star, the true champion of order, the master of all mankind. By my hand worlds die, and by my hand your swarm will wither. All that have come before us have become one with us. We are eternal, and you shall become like us. I am nothing like you, beast. I am beyond you. Celestia falls in with the void, her weapons and power slicing through the warp to strike the hive mind. The Astronomicon, a distant beacon in the void, shudders under the might of her strike, a shriek following soon after as the hive mind draws away. Celestia is not unscarred in her withdrawal, deep gashes forming along the armor of her soul, but it is more than enough to send her message. You think to wound us, become a predator, the hive mind says. You think you are greater than us? The humans call me God Empress, the eternal lord of the Imperium of Man. Celestia cannot help by smirk. For once in my life, I feel happy to indulge them in their little fantasy. The hive mind shrieks and rushes in again, slamming against Celestia once more. She is driven back, 
her retreat covering thousands of kilometers in but a few seconds as the titans battle in the warp, but she remains unbroken. Mystical flames wrap around her as she rises over the void, Celestia's soul blazing as she dives down against the void. She strains, channeling as much power as she can before the shadow overwhelms her, sweat forming on her brow in real space and without before she pulls away from the striking hive mind. You struggle, but achieve nothing. You fight, and only weaken yourself. You cannot destroy us, you cannot save your brood. We will devour all, and you will understand. I am no stranger to futile struggles, alien, Celestia says. Being so weak-minded as you are, you would not understand all that has made me what I am. If you intend to beat me into submission, you will have to try harder than a few choice words and some cheap magic tricks. Struggling delays the truth. All has been devoured, and all will be devoured. You cannot escape us, you cannot fight. I have fought greater beings than you before, all of which have vowed my destruction. Yet here I am. Celestia firms up her shields as the hive mind comes crashing against her once more. As she fights, she sees the glowing light of the Crusader fleet, the lights dimming as one after another returns to real space around Rin's world. Good. Get through. My sons will not suffer from my negligence. Twilight will not die from my mistake. Strange a voice whispers from behind her. Celestia stalls, her spirit growing numb as a new presence drifts through the void. I had come to do away with a parasite, and I find you in my way interesting. Who are you? Celestia demands, bracing as the hive mind crashes against her defenses once more. Three ships wink out completely, lost to the twisting currents of the warp, but she will have a chance to find them again perhaps. That is a question you need not answer, the voice said. But as I said, you're in my way. Move. A surge flared the Astronomicon, and Celestia screamed. Twilight staggered back, a poison barb jutting out of a weak spot in her armor. It did not penetrate deep, but she could see small rivers of blood pouring from the break in her defense. Naomi reached out to steady her, easing Twilight back as Rebecca rushed over to her. How bad is it? The sister superior asked. It really hurts Twilight whimpered, taking a few deep breaths to calm herself as Rebecca snapped off as much of the barb as she could. Don't worry, Tara, Rebecca said, resting her golden-clad arm on the wound. I think I'm getting a good idea of how this element of harmony works. Twilight watched as Rebecca closed her eyes, and soon a golden glow enveloped the sister's hand and Twilight's abdomen. It dissipated after a few seconds, the wound healed and all of Twilight's blood cleaned away. So, do you have to think about something to make it happen, or does it just happen? Twilight asked as the sisters helped her back to her feet. The elements seem to be working a bit differently so any information you can give me would be. Down. Twilight yelped as Naomi tackled her back to the ground, a blast from a biocannon passing through the air where she had been standing before gutting the three ranks of soldiers behind her. Focus, Terra. We still have a battle to fight, and all the time in the world to figure out the artifact later. Yes ma'am, Twilight blurted, getting back to her feet and raising her shield as another salvo of biocannon fire hurtled towards the defense. The Tyranids had brought up some of their bigger creatures, not full bio-titans but close enough, their heavier guns ripping through guardsmen, Astartes, and tanks with contemptuous ease. What few Lehman Rus were not burning hulks returned fire, cannons and last fire streaking through the air and pummeling the advancing Tyranids. The swarm kept coming. No matter how Twilight tried to view the issue, the Imperials were losing. I'm out, Veronica called, dropping back down into the trench and ejecting the latest spent clip from her bolter. Does anyone have more ammunition? Take mine, Rebecca pulled her ammunition pack free and tossing it to her sister. I've been doing so much healing I haven't had a turn at the wall. I doubt you'll get a turn the way these monsters are coming. Veronica reloaded and popped back over the barricade, her bolter roaring as she fired back down the river bank. She was joined soon after by Ruth, the new arrival all too eager to vent her fury at the aliens. The Empress is my shield, and I shall know no fear, Ruth bellowed as she fired into the Tyranids. Fear is the enemy of the living, for it is by fear that cowards spawn to dishearten defenders and soldiers. The Empress is my rock, and master of all. Her shield is truth, and her blade is righteousness. By her will, I shall tread broken glass barefoot, for her light guides my every step. Now die, you spawns of hell. The Empress' wrath is upon you, and you shall be burned in the fires of her hate. She ducked back down as a flurry of devourer worms splattered against the barricade, bits of tyranid flesh raining down on the sisters. It would be like the Xenos to object to her will. At least Fredericks made so many new friends. Judith chirped, undoing her helmet to dislodge a troublesome flesh borer beetle from the mouthpiece. But he's kind of losing his voice. 
I need to find more Promethium if we're going to hold out longer. We'll keep the defense clear for when you return. Naomi replied. Go, now. Judith nodded, clamping her helmet to her belt before moving through the lines in search of more ammunition. Hopefully she finds more fuel before we are overrun. We can hold, Twilight said. The phrase sounded hollow even as it left her mouth, but she pressed on regardless. The Empress is coming, I can feel it. She'll be here soon and save us all, just as she saved Caesarea. I knew there was hope for you, Ruth said, loading a fresh clip into her bolter and giving Twilight a smile. You're speaking like a true sister now. Twilight's mind drew a blank as she tried to consider what Ruth had just said, but pushed the thought away for now. She channeled her power once more, picking a few gargoyles coming in for a strafing run as her target. Before she could cast the spell, a terrible shriek filled the air. Twilight yelped, dropping to her knees and clutching at her ears as the shriek continued, boring through her skull and down into her soul. Her ears rang, though she was certain the shriek was inside her head rather than coming from an outside source, but with the shrieking already present she could not bring her psychic powers to bear. Her eyes slammed shut, not that it did much to stop the sound, her brain rushing as she fought off unconsciousness. Finally, the shriek stopped. All that remained was darkness. Ara Ara Terra. Can you hear me? Twilight's hearing returned first, the sounds of the world around her returning as she felt someone pull her back to her feet. Terra, what happened? Veronica called. I, I don't know, Twilight said, blinking a few times to restore her vision. At first she saw nothing, but soon the white outline of Veronica's hair became prominent, followed by the sister coming back into focus. I was just about to cast a spell when this horrible shrieking started did you hear anything? No Veronica replied, stepping back from Twilight. But perhaps that explains well, look. Twilight had no time to speak before she was yanked towards the barricade, Veronica pushing Ruth and Naomi out of the way to show Twilight. They were dead. All of them. Every single one Twilight saw was dead. Not from gunshots or magical blasts, they looked as if they had seized up and fallen over, like an automaton that had its cord pulled. Twilight tentatively reached out with her magic, searching for any sign of life, but all that came back to her was a cold, unending void. Something had just killed every single tyrant on Rin's world. And I had to hear them all die. Girls Twilight whispered. This is something far worse than I've ever faced before. And it's about to get worse, Ruth snarled. There's something on the other side of the river. Twilight looked to where Ruth was pointing. Standing calmly on the far bank of the river was a man. A monster. He stood as tall as Celestia, perhaps taller given the horn sprouting from his flame-covered head. His armor was a deep crimson lined with silver, the edges sharpened to create a variety of blades and horns. In his right hand he carried a great spiked mace, in his left a large book adorned with a single black mark. The shadows clung to him like a cape, twisting about to form shapes and patterns resembling a thousand screaming faces, all of them fixating on twilight. Staring at him was like staring into the sun, twilight shying away to avoid making full contact with the complete wrongness that was the man. Slaves of the Imperium, he shouted, his voice carrying over the water with ease. The hive mind is dead, slain by the dark god ascendant. Hear now the truth of chaos, and the death of your empire of lies. End of chapter 2.10, The Jaws of Cetus, Swarm.